I'm not going to cover all 122 questions.
The process comes down from the Centers for Disease Control. They survey 2.6 million young people. We also provides the same survey. They surveyed 50,000 young people in 144 schools. We surveyed 10,000 young people over the last um, 10 years. So we have quite a bit of data to use as comparison. So when we look at whether or not young people may be over-reported or under-reported any particular question, what we are left with is a pretty strong sample to look at in terms of comparing. The survey process, we work to procure uh, an appropriate consultant. We work on developing a questionnaire that is reflective of the current issues. This year, the process involved working with our administrators. They wanted to add some questions around stress. Uh, we also added questions about behavioral and mental health a few years ago. It's very difficult, the process of adding and changing questions, because if you change a question, you lose data that you're comparing to. And if you add a question, you're putting a burden on the young people of having one more thing to answer. There's 122 questions, so we're very careful about trying not to uh, make it any bigger than it already is. Um, there is a parent binder that we provide so that parents have some perspective on what is in the survey. And then the, um, the finished uh, product gets to the health educators. They provide it in their wellness classes. Young people take their survey anonymously. It's voluntary. If parents choose not to have their young person um, participate, that's okay. They're provided with uh, an alternative activity. And then we provide the scan terms of the survey over to Rothenbach. They scan and clean them. Um, they take a sample of all of the overall surveys, and then they generate data which comes back to us. Um, the parent binder contains some, some key information, the standard item rationale, which is a um, research-based rationale for each question that's asked. So if parents have questions on why do you ask a certain question, there's a way to look at why we do ask a question. There's no question that's there by mistake. They're all very well thought out and very strategic. Um, we also have the, the previous cycle's results so parents can get a sense of what the last survey looked like. We have the current questionnaire, and then we've also put together frequently asked questions because of some of the questions we get every cycle. So this is an example of rationale. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it just gives them a sense of what's the national data, what's the research around asking this question, why are we asking the question, and what the changes have been over the long term. These are the survey categories. Um, we structure them into um, these key areas, school climate, substance misuse, violence and bullying, body and life safety, body and diet, and physical activity and health, and that totals 122 questions. Our sample this year, overall, it was um, 1,057 students in the sample. Um, pretty well split across the grades. Grade 10 was a little bit higher, larger um, sample. And then for gender, we had a pretty decent breakdown. We also added a, a option to use a gender question this year based on the Centers for Disease Control recommendation that we allow young people to offer an other response if they are transgendered or choose to identify as a gender or another gender. So we did have that, and 6% of young people chose to, to check that box. Um, we also added a question on sexual orientation, and we found that young people were able to describe how they felt their sexual orientation is. So you can see that 4%, um, 3% around there for gay or lesbian, and um, between 3 and 6% for bisexual, and then young people who are still questioning. The reason um, we asked this particular question is what we know from the national data is that young people who are, um, identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, or questioning have disparities in their health status, and they're at um, one of the higher risks for suicide. So it's a particular area that we really need to keep an eye on. I'm going to show you the comparison samples. The state and the national data always lags uh, one to two years behind our data. So when we give you our 2015 data, we can only compare it to the 2013 state national data, which is kind of frustrating <laughs> because it doesn't give you a real picture, but we do the best we can. Um, we also, um, but when we look at state and national data, they are samples that are weighted for demographics. So our sample is our full sample, and the state and national sample is weighted for demographics, and they choose particular areas to make sure it's representative of the United States. Um, so this just gives you an idea. And right in 2015, you can see we had a lower rate of using cigarettes compared to the state and the um, national rate. So just gives you an idea. You can also see over here with PJ, so that's a local question that we added. Uh, the state and the nation hasn't caught up, and they're not asking that question quite yet. 
We know that risk-taking behavior doesn't occur in isolation, but sometimes when you look at the data, it's a little concerning because you see 20% of have uh, been bullied and 10% experienced sexual assault and 5% experienced this. And we think about adding that all up and it feels really overwhelming. It, it feels like 90% of the kids are at high risk. And that's really not how it works because we know that these behaviors are clustered. So when we look at the overall rate of risk, it's about 13% of our young people that are at high risk for multi-clustered behaviors. When we look at analyzing across all the risk categories, what we found is that the behaviors that had the most frequency across all of the areas was nicotine use, underage drinking and marijuana use, depressive symptoms, fasting or restrictive type behaviors, which are related to anorexia, and seriously considered suicide. Those are our most frequently reported behaviors. When we look at risk by age, our ninth graders had a lower rate of substance abuse, sexual activity, and indoor tanning use. So those areas in particular stood out, that freshman had lower rates. When we look at risk by age for grade 12, we saw some areas that had different rates of prevalence. Lifetime substance use, higher prevalence rate as young people age, they're more likely to experiment with substances. Past 30 day use, higher rate, except with e vaping, the 11th grade was slightly higher. Auto safety, higher rate of driving drug impaired, and texting and emailing while driving. But I will caution you, when you see the texting and email while driving rates, they seem scary, but the adult rates are actually 10% higher than the teen rates. So, <laughs> wow. That's so um, the 12th graders also have higher prevalence of trying to lose weight, using diet pills or powders, and vomiting or laxative use. Um, they also reported a higher rate of difficulty concentrating compared to the younger peers, and that's a question that we've added um, as a local question. There's no comparison for that. And also the indoor tanning use was at the highest at the 12th grade. Some of the protective factors for grade 12, they had the lowest rate of bullying, um, higher rate of school connectedness compared to their younger peers, higher rate of seatbelt use, um, they have the highest prevalence of being treated for behavioral, mental, or emotional problems, meaning they access support, which is very good. And then also a higher rate of three days or more with physical activity. In terms of risk by gender, um, I don't like to extrapolate too much on gender. There are some areas that stick out that I want to share with you that, that are really clear and break off across gender categories. But because we have an other response, the data is so small, we can't really analyze that information. So keeping this in mind, this is some generaliz generalizations. But the data shows that males had higher rates of drug use and binge drinking. Um, we know that from all of our research over the last 10 years, when it comes to um, illegal drugs, particularly heroin, steroids, meth, cocaine, males um, typically use at a rate of three to one compared to females. Um, weapon carrying and getting into physical fights is higher with males having two or more sexual partners, um, being injured from a suicide attempt, diet pills or powders compared to females. And we've seen that trend over the last five cycles where young men um, are more likely to start using pills and powders to bulk up or to gain muscle, um, but they're also falling into some of the restrictive habits that relate to anorexia and bulimia. Um, having property stolen or damaged, and they actually had higher rates of sleep. So that was a positive. <laughs> Uh, females reported higher rates of depression, the non-suicidal self-injury, which is cutting, burning, scratching, picking, pulling, any type of self-mutilation, eating disorders, current alcohol use, sexual assault, feeling unsafe at school and being bullied. They also had higher um, perceived peer and parental disapproval for risky behaviors compared to males. Males perceived that their peers would um, be more approving of their risky behaviors compared to females. Um, texting and emailing while driving, trying to lose weight or describing themselves as overweight. There was a real marked difference between the females perceiving themselves as overweight compared to the males, and indoor tan use. We have some really good news to report on school, connect, school connectedness. Can't say that word. <laughs> um, in 2007, our rate was 62% of our young people said that they had a trusted adult in the school that they could go to about a personal problem. And in 2015, the rate increased to 74%. So we're really proud of that. We know that there's been so much work done um, on so many levels to try to improve that. And then you can see for the family and community connectedness, it stayed about the same, pretty steady. 
When we look at sleep on an average school night, 26% um, of the freshmen got eight or more hours of sleep compared to only 15% of juniors. So we can see as they age up, they're getting less sleep. 12% um, of the seniors reported four hours or less of sleep compared to 5% of freshmen. So four hours isn't much to go on. <laughs> That's concerning for sure. Um, and then you can see kind of the breakout. I know that sleep is um, a factor that the superintendent's been looking at in terms of um, delayed start times and things along those lines. And we know from a lot of the research that the more sleep and being on the um, circadian rhythm that works for adolescents is better overall. But this is just a little bit on, on that. We asked some new questions um, this year on negative stressors. We asked young people, what do you perceive as the most stressful parts of your day? And young people reported that schoolwork was the biggest stressor, followed by being too busy, um, worried about the future, school expectations. What's interesting is that the family or personal really is kind of down the list. And I think sometimes we tend to think of peer pressure, social issues, family issues being a real big, significant piece of what young people worry about. But the day-to-day -day is really school. So school plays a big role in how they feel about their stress levels. Um, sources of stress, um, what they reported most frequently was their workload, studying hard things, getting up in the AM, and teacher expectations. Now, these may or may not be negative, but these are just what they identify as their sources of stress. Um, in terms of depression-related um, questions, this is a question that asks young people if they felt sad or hopeless for two or more weeks. Um, when you think about it from an adult perspective, that doesn't seem like a long time, two weeks. But in a young person's world, two weeks is a very long time. And it is an indicator. It doesn't mean a young person has depression. It just means that it's concerning. Um, so what we saw for the data going back to 2005, 22% reported a dep depression-related um, measure. And now we see it at 29%. So we can see the increase over time. Um, when we look at our 10-year average, um, it's actually 23%. And that compares to the, the national rate of 29%. The 2013 rates for the state and the nation are 30% and 22%. So we're right in the ballpark of where the state and the national rates are. <coughs> um, in terms of adolescent depression, what we know from some of the data is that it has increased by 3% nationally. Um, in terms of the clinical studies, in terms of young people being identified with major depressive disorder or different types of depression, whether it's dysthymia or bipolar, um, there is an increase in young people taking and accessing services. But on average, only 38% of young people who experience depression access treatment. So that's why it's really important that we continue to do the work around identifying and referring young people to sources to refer to. In terms of long suicidal self-injury, um, that's injuring themselves on purpose without the intention of, of killing oneself. So it's the idea of harming oneself, sacrificing a part of the body to save the self. It's a way of coping. Um, and what young people reported is 22% in 2015, and you can see that's been an increase over time. That's reflective of what's going on nationally. And it is higher amongst our young ladies. Suicidality. We ask a series of questions to get at what is going on with this particular area. What we know is if young people are seriously considering suicide, they're more likely to make a plan. And if they make a plan, they're more likely to attempt. So we ask these series of questions to get at the actual ideation. So when you look at the data, what you can see is in 2005, 11% ever seriously considered suicide. Of the 11%, 9% made a plan, and 7% actually attempted. <coughs> Compared to where we are in 2015, 17% considered, 13% made a plan, and 10% actually attempted. What we can see is the shift in the number of young people who are seriously considering but not making a plan. That's indicative of young people accessing support and resources or having an opportunity to think about things before they get to the planning stage, which is, although it may seem upsetting, it's good news that young people are accessing resources in between those two uh, points. Sometimes those two, two points happen very quickly, so it's a really key opportunity to intervene. If we look at um, over time, our 10-year average is the green right here. It's about 13% of young people seriously considering suicide. 
11% making a plan and 10% actually attempting. So you can see that the, the thinking about it really does have a strong impact on the making of the plan. So when a young person um, discusses anything around this particular issue, we take it very seriously because it is not um, primal, it is real, and it's something that we need to address. Um, when you compare that to our um, other rates, what you can see is that there is a 6% increase in young people who seriously consider suicide um, and a slight increase in attempts and in planning. So that's an area that we'll be keeping a close eye on. It's an area we're already addressing in a lot of different ways, whether it's through youth mental health first aid, mm -hmm. through the work that Dias is doing, through the work that we're doing um, at each of the grade levels. There's a lot of work happening. In terms of data context for suicide, the long-term analysis used to give you a sense of actual suicide deaths. If you look at the rates in 1950, only 5% of young people ages 15 to 24 committed suicide, or um, compared to um, 2013, we can see that um, it's 11%, so the rate actually doubled. And what you can see is that the older folks, it changed into um, being more, more, a portion more of young people actually um, taking their life. The overall rate in 1950 was 13%. The overall rate in 2013 is 13%. So the ages have changed, but the rate is the exact same. We know that suicide has multiple contributing factors. There's no easy answers. It's very complex. But I put this up here just to remind you of all of that. It's, it's very involved in terms of trying to figure out what will work. There's a lot of new research around um, what are the right interventions to help a young person who's had multiple suicide attempts? What we find is that young people who've attempted more than once are at higher risk. And there are very few treatment options for young people who have ongoing suicidal ideation. So that is an area that um, is a, a new area of research and there's a growing body of work around trying to find better treatments to address that particular issue. But we do know that substance use does not help. We know that when young people um, have not been treated for a severe medical or mental health issue. Basically, mental illness is the leading risk factor for suicide. The Children's Safety Network, which is a community of practice, focuses on sharing their better practices. There's lots of things that they recommend that we're very much in line with in what we do, whether it's enhancing protective factors, reducing risk factors, um, and implementing screening and prevention. When we look at our overall um, amount of young people who are already accessing support, we ask young people, are you now taking medicine, medicine or receiving treatment for a mental health or behavioral health issue? In 2013, 18% of young people said that they were, and in 2015, 21% were. So we're happy to see that more young people are accessing support. The national rate, although we don't have a youth risk behavior survey comparison, the national rate around most studies is 20% should be in treatment. So we're pretty close to that. And then you can see um, a little bit of a shift in the, um, the number of young people in each grade that access services. We added a new mental health question. I think that this was um, maybe Assistant Superintendent Craig Martin's suggestion when we talked about some of the areas around difficulty concentrating. So this was a recommendation, and we did some research to find the right wording. And what we found is that there were quite a few young people that felt like it, they had difficulty concentrating due to a physical, mental, and emotional problem. What's interesting about that is when we look at parents and we survey them, only 5% of parents um, perceived their young person had a difficulty concentrating. So there's a big, big gap between what young people are perceiving and what the parents are perceiving. So we got through mental health. Now we're into substance use. You guys still with me? Yeah. We're okay? Have you bored you this year again? <coughs> okay, so tobacco and nicotine use. Um, we shifted our language because nicotine comes in so many different forms, not just tobacco related forms now. So you'll be seeing the word nicotine more and more. Um, nicotine is the most addictive substance that we know, and so it's an area that we're always concerned about. When we look at our 10 year average of young people ever using cigarettes, um, our rate um, is 28%, our 10-year average, which is really good. That's much lower than the United States and the Massachusetts rate. And the recent smokeless tobacco rate is about the same. But when we asked young people this year for the first time, are you vaping? 
uh, 24% responded yes. So any games you've made in cigarettes have gone right to the e-vaping. So it's, it's a no-win. But what it does point out is that when there is a large-scale public policy effort around a particular issue like tobacco was, and we made all of the changes around getting tobacco out of our homes, out of our businesses, out of our hospitals, we saw our shift in use. What we're seeing with e-vaping is an unregulated market, and they're making tons of money, and it's, it's really picked up that pocket of young people um, that we lost with, with the cigarettes. So it's, it's definitely an area we'll keep an eye on. In terms of marijuana, a very similar thing happened here. We saw decreases in marijuana use. We knew that that really wasn't reflective of what anecdotally we were hearing because synthetic marijuana hit the market. Synthetic marijuana is sold as um, non-edible products. Um, it's known as K2 Spice, uh, Ivory Snow. There's different names for it. It's packaged and sold at head shops and other places. Um, it goes for about 20 bucks. They're made um, in, in different places, mostly coming from overseas. But basically, it is a artificial substance that's sprayed with chemicals to look like marijuana, um, but it has a higher psychoactive component to it. So when we asked young people, have you used marijuana, we got a certain rate, 24%. Then we asked them, are you using synthetic marijuana? 8%. So whatever gains we were able to achieve on lowering marijuana use were picked up by the increase in synthetic marijuana. So that stayed about the same. Lifetime substance abuse. So ask me and people if you've ever used a substance. You can see that alcohol is the most widely used substance, followed by marijuana, e-vapor products, cigarettes, and then prescription drugs that are not prescribed to them. And then as you get up the list, you can see illegal drug in injection, non-prescribed steroids, meth, and heroin. These areas right here, the rates are low, but they're concerning because of the obviously the in intense harm that those drugs can cause. Past 30 days substance use, so what young people have used in the last month prior to the survey. Um, alcohol continues to lead, lead the way, um, followed by marijuana. Um, Nicotine products, non prescribed um, prescription medication, and then cocaine. We've seen cocaine um, stay about the same between 5 and 8% over the last 10 years, but it's still concerning, and we are hearing from our um, sources in terms of the New England drug market that cocaine is more prevalent in our area. In terms of the big picture, how we kind of stack up <coughs> compared to ourselves in 2013, compared to the state, compared to the nation. Um, you can see that we have a lower rate of ecstasy, uh, a slightly lower rate of um, heroin compared to ourselves in 2013, but we're still higher than the state and the national rate. Methamphetamines, uh, very similar. Non-prescribed steroids, similar. Cocaine, um, as I mentioned, that's an area of concern. And then there's a question that we ask young people, not about a particular substance, but were they offered, sold, or given an illegal drug on school property? And you can see our rates are lower than the state and the nation, but of course any amount is too much for us. So it's an area that we're constantly looking at. So overall big picture, we've, we've seen drops in recent marijuana use, recent prescription drug use, cigar use, alcohol use, and, drink, and drinking. Um, drops in ever used marijuana, but as I mentioned, we're cautious because we saw the increase in synthetic marijuana. Um, and then the drop in ever used cigarettes. <coughs> what we're seeing go up a little bit, um, ecstasy, um, a little bit with cocaine, smoke and tobacco. Um, over time, over the last 10 years, we saw a slight increase in heroin, meth, and steroids, hallucinogens, and inhalants. Inhalants have had the biggest jump that we've seen typically. Inhalant use goes down from middle school up to high school, and what we're seeing is a reverse trend. Unmanaged drinking, we have some really good news in terms of what we're seeing here. Um, we have significant drops in the number of young people who've ever used alcohol, recently used alcohol, and actually binge drink. Binge drinking is obviously of concern because of alcohol poisoning, and what we're seeing is decreases in all of those areas. And the overall decreases for lifetime use were down 12% since 2005. 12% since 2005. <laughs> 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 These things inch like one or two percent. So 12% is major. Um, 
When your immune is down 7%, binge drinking is down 7%. When you think about binge drinking being down 7%, that is significant risk reduction for our young people. Um, and then if you look at overall 10-year um, averages compared to the U.S. rate, we are lower than the U.S. rate in all of those areas. We also looked at our rates compared to our policy implementation um, because there were some significant tipping points that we had. Um, in 2009 and 10, the um, Board of Selectmen and the town manager and the police department worked together to do a full-scale change in liquor policy. It was the first um, look at liquor policy in 13 years. They made 17 changes to the policy. And one of the key changes was asking people who sell or serve alcohol to be sure that they're trained because it's, there is such a significant risk when you are selling or serving that you could overserve or not ID someone properly. Uh, since that change, um, we've seen decreases. And then in 2011, 2012, the school chemical health policy was passed by the school committee. And then our police chief implemented a zero tolerance policy, which requires all officers to refer young people who are encountered related to their substance use. So you can see that there is an impact in terms of having a comprehensive strategy across the town on a particular issue that we can start to see some decrease. Okay, we're gonna shift gears and go into weapon carrying and physical fight injury. Anytime people see weapon carrying in school, it's scary. Um, but when we look over time, the rates are pretty close. Um, they range between eight and 14%. So this is a question that we asked young people, have you carried a weapon other than for hunting, camping, or fishing on school grounds? And this is what they've reported. Then we also asked young people, have you been injured in a physical fight requiring medical treatment? So something that really rose beyond a, a scuffle. And um, we have the information for that. You can see in 2015, the rate dropped by half, which is good news. And then if you look over time, um, compared to the national rate, our rate of weapon carrying is 10%. The national rate is 18%. So although it's never good news to hear about weapon carrying, it is lower than the national rate. The state rate is 12%. Um, carrying a gun past 30 days, that rate stays about the same. If you look at all the national figures, they pretty much stay between 4 and 6%. There is very little shift. Um, threatened or injured with a weapon on school property, that also does there's very little shift in that, but we can see it's between 4 and 8%. And a physical fight, um, without um, asking about the injury piece, overall in 2015 was 15%, um, which is lower than it was the last time. When we look at bullying, um, there's a number of questions we ask. I think there's six questions overall, but I'm going to share just a few of the key four measures. Um, when we ask young people if you've been bullied at school, when we look at our overall rates in 2011, um, 27%, and in 2015, 24%, so a slight, slight drop. And then for electronic bullying, um, it has um, gone down a tiny bit. The electronic bullying is a question that we added in 2011, so I didn't compare the data going back further because we don't have comparisons for that, so I decided to just go 2011 forward for both of them. And you can see how they compare to the state and nation. Perceived safety. This is a question we ask young people um, if they chose, um, if they feel like they're unsafe in going to school, and um, either on the way from or in, at, on the school grounds. And this is what they reported in 2015: uh, six percent uh, reported feeling unsafe. That's a slight drop from 2013, and then the overall. Average 10 year rate is 6%. Dating violence and sexual assault. So, we started asking young people about dating violence uh, three cycles ago, and um, what they reported is um, 8, 9, and 11%. So, we've seen 3% increase. That's reflective of the national numbers that we're seeing. Um, and then we also asked a question around have you been physically forced to have sexual intercourse? And 9% reported that they, in fact, had been forced. So obviously concerning an area that we'll all be looking at. I know that there is a um, group already of students at the high school who've been talking about this issue and, and meeting with Ms. Hooper, our general ed social worker, and we've been sharing resources around that, and there may be um, some initiatives that will follow around that specific issue. In terms of 
of experiencing violence in a dating relationship if we look at our national numbers as well as our rates for 2011 forward. Um, they stayed pretty close between 8 and 11 percent. And then you can see that the, um, the um, sexual intercourse um, or sexual assault is um, about the same. Just the now U.S. rate 2013 is slightly lower than our rate. We also ask young people if they voluntarily engage in sexual intercourse. Um, and we actually have a very low rate compared to the state and the nation. Um, in 2015, 26% um, reported that they engage in sexual intercourse. And then we ask a follow-up question of those that reported sexual intercourse, did they use a condom? And so these rates on the side here are of those who reported yes to the first question. And you can see that we actually have um, a rate of condom use around 16%, which is actually really strong. Um, and then if you look at how we compare, so the ever had sexual intercourse um, rate in writing is 26%, and the um, US rate is 47%. So that's very significant to look at. Um, it also means that we have a much lower rate of teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases and um, and then you can see our common use rate is also much higher than the state and the national rate. We ask young people, are they getting prevention education in the school setting? And we added questions on nutrition, substance use, and bullying prevention in 2013. So we have comparison data for those. And in 2015, 79%, 78%, 88%, and 82% said that they got education in those areas. And Ms. Jose, I'll let you explain the half-year program, if you would, so that folks can see why they might be less than 100. Yeah, uh, the, the HIV AIDS question comes up frequently. And I always use that as like a qualifier. Sometimes people will say, I, do, do, do our students take this survey seriously? So typically what we see with the, this question is it's given at the end of first semester or the beginning of second semester. So for our freshmen, they have completed their decisions health education course. So those ones would typically be saying that yes, they have received some HIV or human sexuality um, education, whereas the other half of the, the freshman class has not. So that, that, that's a qualifier that I sometimes look at to see how serious our students are taking the, the YMDS. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of the support that our class has provided, we've tried, tried to provide comprehensive support in the areas of alcohol use, illegal drug use, and mental health areas, whether it's on um, developing policy, looking at projects or programs, and providing technical assistance, especially around things like youth or student use. And now I'm ready for questions. Yes, Mrs. Epps. Thank you, Mrs. Brosky. And let me know if you need me to back up to anything. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say that today I was actually spending time going through the actual results and, and not as much time through the report. So I just want to say thank you very much for the amount of time that it took to really put this uh, enormous amount of data um, together into um, something that's really meaningful. Um, I think it's just going to take a little bit more to, to um, you know, focus on the data and say what are the, the pieces. I know. One thing that I was a little struck by that's in the data that's in the presentation, I think, is there's a bunch of questions that ask the students, how would your parents um, yes. feel about this? So have your parents communicated to you that they think um, smoking marijuana is very wrong, wrong, a little wrong, uh, or not wrong at all? Um, and there's four questions about tobacco, marijuana, alcohol, and prescription drug use. And frankly, I was sort of surprised. The only one that I think we do really well at is the prescription drug use. Yeah. And students reported that um, only three to five, this is their report of how they perceive their parents talking to them, that three to five percent of the students think that th their parents would um, uh, disapprove. They would think, oh, using pr prescription drugs that aren't yours is OK. Um, and so that means, you know, 95% of the parents are communicating effectively that this is very wrong or wrong. Um, so I'm really, I'm, I'm quite disturbed by the other categories, actually, where that's not the case. And I think um, 
for the marijuana, it was only 80% of the parents were perceived to communicate that marijuana use is very wrong or wrong. And, um, and these percentages shift dramatically from ninth to 12th grade. So as far as I know, none of these kids are 21, or most, that's actually we do have some um, <laughs> students in a great uh, new program. But for the most part, this is not legal. They're either illegal substances or the legal substances are not legal for them. And I, 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 so I, I just feel like we, as a community, have to you know, keep looking at this data and looking at what our messaging is. And it's very important that the school community is making it an effort, and RACASA and the select meeting, the community is making an effort to communicate how important it is that these risky behaviors, that, that they identify these. You don't drink or use drugs and get behind the wheel of a car. You don't sit next to somebody in a car. So, but if, but if, the, if that's what's being communicated from the parents, you know, I know that, I, that's interesting, that they're stressed by all the school stuff because they, they spend a good part of their day here, but I don't know, they, they spend the rest of their, you know, lives with their family. I, they probably do spend more time in school as a high school student than they do at home, but I don't know, I'm just, uh, I think as a community, we have a lot of work to do to dig into this data, understand what it means, look at ourselves, and make sure we're modeling and communicating. This is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. And everyone should be going to see Dr. Hill next week or two weeks. Yeah. So I didn't put the data in for a, a very good reason. We don't have comparative data to show you yet for the national rate. So these set of questions around perceived peer disapproval, perceived parental disapproval, those are questions that are required by the Federal Drug Free Communities grant that we have. And the only comparison data that we have for those questions are other drug free communities. So we don't yet have data from those communities for the most recent set of data to kind of show you a comparison. We can show you how it looks from year to year and when we've asked the questions. The wording of the questions has changed slightly over time, so our baseline to comparison is not perfect. But what I will say is that overall marijuana um, disapproval has definitely gone down. Um, and we've seen that uh, coincide with um, what our state is doing around medical marijuana and some of the other attitudes that have softened around the issue. Um, so we definitely will be sharing more about that information when we have better compare comparison <coughs> information to share with you. But what I will say, it doesn't mean that parents aren't communicating, it just may mean that the messaging isn't getting through or young people feel like there is a higher risk, uh, higher reward for the risk that they're taking. Mm -hmm. So the payoff is worth it. <laughs> right. And that's the area that's really tough. So the messaging can be great, but if from a behavioral standpoint, their reward is better than the messaging, then that's going to win out. And so that's an area we have to look at um, in our culture. You know, Mrs. Webb's comment, actually, something I was thinking about as I went through the data myself, really does involve parents. And I think we're seeing on the school, on the academic side, there's sort of, I feel like there's, a f we're increasingly reaching out to parents, and I'll use the new math curriculum as an example. Hey, we have a new math curriculum at elementary parents. Why don't you come to the school? We'll show you how we're teaching math and what you can do at home. And I think that's been very effective and very well received. So I think that we need to be looking at how we address these issues in the schools, um, and certainly on the sports fields and in extracurriculars. But I think bringing parents in is a really powerful idea and something we could be doing more of as a community. So parents are being being empowered with, here's how you can have these conversations with your kid. And you know, even if you might feel that they're not listening, they are. And here's a good way to have that conversation. So I, I think that brings up a really good point about how we engage the parent community um, to help be part of this process. I would just add, I, I appreciate what uh, uh, this web had to say regarding the opportunity to really, you know, look at the data at a, at a more thorough uh, capacity than we were able to do just in a short period of time, although it was really good data that you sent out, but again, I guess I like to look at where we are with the United States, so Ma Massachusetts actually, and, and then past data as well. But um, I think relative to, to what uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, uh, Borowski just said was that um, parents, um, that's a challenge to get to get them to come, and um, I think you know my my personal experience as as an administrator and working as the coalition chair in Danvers was we actually had to mandate them to come and um, things like uh, if your child's going to attend the junior or senior prom you must come out tonight to this particular talk we had the uh, 
assistant uh, district attorney um, in um, Essex County come and talk about um, essentially um, from parents providing alcohol, um, social hosting and all that. Mm -hmm. And that was effective and it did make a difference and um, did, did allow parents, I think, to have better conversations. And, and, and Danvers, to be quite frank, had some major problems when we went there and uh, we did see a lot of progress. Um, I know we're not going to talk about program, but I do think that it's going to be important to talk about program because the budget season is coming up and it's going to be a tough budget. And uh, as a strong advocate for uh, improved health education or, or more health education, um, programming I think is something we'll need to talk about at some point in time. Can I add just a word around parent opportunities? Um, we are just inviting parents in the next week or so um, to engage in a free program that our CAS is offering. We have 150 scholarships for parents to take an online program called Active Parenting of Teens. And it's an eight week program that you can log on one hour a week and follow through on a module. You get a book as a companion. There's lots of activities that you can do with your children. Um, I made myself a guinea pig in the last cycle and tried it out on my team. And what I found was it was really helpful to have some things just kind of clicking in the back of your mind as you went through your week. And we did some of our activities in the car on the way to activities <laughs> and also at family dinner and things like that. And I will say that um, it's a really excellent program. It's from the SAMHSA Registry of Evidence-Based Practices. So we have 150 scholarships for that, parents of high school students, parents of middle school students, and then also there is an element for parents of preteens. So we encourage people to get in touch with our CAS if they're interested in accessing that online program. Parents did say that because of being so busy that they were having trouble getting to events, so this is offering an opportunity for them to do that. And we did have um, 30 parents um, participate in the pilot program last spring and they had really great feedback about, about this particular program. So. Will you, people to sign up. will you be advertising that through the various school newsletters? Yes. Good, because I, I think that's where parents will hear about just it. Just in the process of getting info to principals, PTOs, and then um, we'll be traveling around. Great, <laughs> great. Ms. Sarah, I Dr. Dr. Doxer. Thank you. I, I also wanted to thank you for this thorough report from all the data that you sent home, as well as this report, which brought in the comparisons, which was really important. I recognize the power of parents, but I also recognize the power of peers. And I loved that those questions were there about whether they thought their peers would approve of their behavior, whether they got into a car next to a peer if, who had been driving. Those were very powerful points. And I think that as well as focusing in on engaging the parents, I think we need, and I know you know this, to engage the kids in changing their perception of what's okay, what's cool, what's, um, they're, they're not vulnerable and they need to know that. Um, and so the programming that you're doing, I know you have clubs at each school and um, we've had programs that strive to educate the kids from the real point of view, not just parents talking to kids, but them learning from people who have experienced how it can go wrong. Um, I think that's really important, the message from peers to peers. We don't approve. It's not cool. Don't get in the car from him. Stop it. Um, and so I appreciate that. And then I also wanted to ask, I know that in terms of the violence, um, the teen dating violence, that kind of stuff, I know we've had an opportunity the last two years to go to the Courage to Care conference, um, which uses the MVP program at Lincoln Sudbury, and I anticipate that we will have another invitation this year, and having attended the last two years, I highly encourage us to take advantage. It's a free conference. It's very powerful to see what other schools are doing. The speakers are very powerful and come from a very real place of um, unfortunate experience. So I'd really encourage us to think about um, enabling our kids to take advantage of programs that are also offered by other districts. And um, I just think it's important for them to talk to each other and decide to change this perception. Absolutely. Thank you. Mrs. Joyce. I just wanted to point out, when you were talking about parental involvement, um, two of the 
events that I've attended recently, the If Only Wahlberg film and this team panel on social media were two of the most attended events I have ever been to. Mm -hmm. And I was very encouraged by seeing the participation from the families. Mm -hmm. So I do think it is important to reach them. But I think when we, when we give them those vehicles, the people are, the people are starting to come out. And, and you know, I, it, I was encouraged by both of those. Thank you. Mrs. Tuff. I was just wondering if the, with regard to the vaping, mm -hmm. if we've been able to like sort of update the curriculum yep. quickly enough, um, and mm -hmm. is it is it in the, the freshman and the junior? Yep. Oh, okay. So um, we started educating on other tobacco products um, starting in 2007. Um, most districts um, started around 2009, 2010, and e-vaping um, around Starting in 2012, we started talking about it. It wasn't as prevalent. What we saw this year was an explosion of vaping stores. And that's really when kind of the tipping point happened, and that's when we saw the use triple. So it's also the market share has really increased, and so we've been doing the education, but it's very similar to alcohol and marijuana messaging. When it's all around you, it's very difficult to compete with that. So prevention messaging can be strong, but when the market is stronger, sometimes that, that's where we're challenged. I just one other comment. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate uh, all the hard work, the district, and the specifically the high school, on the connectedness. Because I'm pretty sure, you know, we, this has been a long time. We've been really working on this a long time, and I do think that that can be, you know, that can be the thing that makes a big difference. Um, is that a young person has someone either here at the school or you know an outside in the community that they can talk to and that they can trust and that they're just going to give you that little piece of information that is going to make a huge difference in the next day or the next week for them. So I really appreciate that that's taken a lot of hard work and, you know, commitment to programming. Um, and we still have work to do there, as Mr. Nyan likes to say, but the, um, you know, <coughs> thank you to the, the high school staff and district staff for supporting that. I just, I also, you made me think, Mrs. Webb, thank you. I was thinking about the data that we saw about the, um, the, the trends in the bullying. And one thing that I noticed was that from 9th to 12th, the bullying trends go down. And I think that might be a model of, of practice that the kids seem to be getting it, that it's not okay, and then hopefully working together um, to stop that as opposed to the substance abuse, which was going in the opposite direction. Somehow they were figuring out, well, actually not over time, yeah. but w in the snapshot, when you look at the grades from 9 to 12, the bullying went down from 9th grade to 12th grade, mm -hmm. but the um, substance abuse went up mm -hmm. from 9th to 12th, but I'm very heartened that even though it went up from 9th to 12th, that's less than it has been in the past. And part of why we see the difference in those behaviors is that substance misuse is a coping mechanism and bullying is a, a, it comes from a different place. Mm -hmm. So um, they're both multi-clustered behaviors that go along with, uh, with other things. Um, but I think the coping piece is really important to recognize when we look at all of our information, you can see that young people are trying to cope, whether it's negatively or positively, they're trying to manage. They have a lot in their plates. And it's not all young people, but many young people are really struggling with quite a bit uh, mentally and emotionally. Our guidance staff does an amazing job in helping them manage all of that on a day-to-day -day basis. And our administrators do a great job, our school nurses. Um, so much of what our school nurses see is mental and emotional uh, support. And so overall, when we look at the information, what we're really talking about is trying to help young people cope more positively. And um, we can use that bullying piece as a model, but then also think about why are the rates going up? Is it that the adult model of stress management is negatively coping mm -hmm. with other things? Mm -hmm. Just one more comment. I, I, I wanted to um, point out something that uh, Dr. Doctor also mentioned too is the uh, peer impact. And um, I know we've had a heightened attention to suicide ideation, and um, there is um, a lot of evidence based practices out there that uh, do put uh, into into work, um, Signs of Suicide, which is an evidence-based program that does rely on s peers, you know, recognize, peers, peers are more, more likely to recognize a student that's going to potentially um, plan a suicide or potentially 
commit suicide. They're the ones that are going to hear about it first, and uh, SOS does a nice job in terms of, uh, there's evidence to support it. And um, I think you can also look at a skills-based approach to health education also as one that uh, su you'll see peers supporting peers. Okay, just one more thing, and maybe um, Erica or Julianne was also going to mention this, but I think it's really, really important. I know there's some cards here, but we have um, Dr. Hill is coming on the 29th, which is next Thursday. Thursday. And um, other than this copy of the book, they're available at the Reading Public Library. Um, if anybody wants to read, this is the book that he wrote, which is um, Marijuana, the Unbiased Truth About the World's Most Popular Weed. Um, so I would certainly encourage people to um, spread the word, and I would hope that we can, you know, fill the pack. That'd be awesome. So. And Dr. Hill is a practicing psychiatrist at McLean. Um, comes really highly recommended. He doesn't take a particular position. What he's trying to do in his book is put forth the latest research and also the research questions we've yet to address before we look at things like um, young people using marijuana more broadly when we look at some of the uh, ballot measures that are coming up. Oh, sure. Just be indulged for one more second. I was remembering that when I went to the Mass Association of School Committees lobby day last spring, and um, I was taken aside by Senator Lewis and thanked for the role that Reading has played in the safe and supportive schools progress across the state, um, and also sat down with some kids at a table, and they were amazed at our Rakasa and one of their communities had just started something. But I just wanted to highlight again that the work that it took, and Chief Cormier is here, and a lot of the other people that were instrumental in helping with PASA, including you and Julianne, coming to where it is, and how ahead, how important it was that Reading together recognized the need and where we've come to with this. And, and it could be far worse. And so I just want to say, this opportunity to discuss the risk surveys and to be honest about what's going on in our schools and put the programs in place. That's a, I feel very proud of Reading when I go to other places. And as worried as I am about our kids and the stress level and the substance abuse, I feel like <coughs> we're tuned into it and we're not turning our heads away, which is so important. So I wanted to thank everybody that was involved in forming the RACASA and then keeping it going and the communication necessary for families and kids. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you as well for being here this evening. You said it was the beginning of a larger conversation. That's, that's clearly the case. Um, there's some, some good news in there, but a lot of concerning news as well. Uh, as Mr. Nyan pointed out, budget season is around the corner. and. Um, Clearly, a priority is going to be doing everything that we can to support our kids and help see better trends in two years. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Right. Um, moving on. Okay. How about we take a five-minute, brief five-minute recess?
in session. Next up on the agenda, I'm going to be turning it over to Michael Seibert, our Director of Finance and Operations, and Sharon Engstrom, our town accountant, to talk about the status of our revolving funds. So thank you and good evening. Um, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide you with an update. Um, Sharon and I have been working on this uh, since the audit con review came out and the audit comments indicated that we needed to take a, a look at our revolving funds. So Sharon and I carved out some time over the summer to tackle some of them. And so um, I'm going to let her do kind of the introduction and then I'll walk you through each revolving fund and uh, it's kind of a, a joint presentation. <laughs> So as you know, in fiscal 14's audit, we had a management letter comment um, indicating that some of our revolving funds were carrying some pretty high balances. I think they referred to them to 6 to 24 months of respective expenditures um, and pointed to the possibility that there may be some um, matching issues where we're not matching our revenues and our expenditures because, you know, as a school district, we're not in a business to make money. It's, it should be not for profit. Um, so we shouldn't be building large balances. It should be we're charging what it costs us to run a program. And so that was a, a clear indication that we need to look at something. If the auditors have picked up on it, they've been kind of watching it for a couple of years. When I first started here, I immediately noticed a problem with the, um, the support from some of the revolving funds, particularly um, the four largest ones that um, we were looking at um, tonight. Um, largely that we had budgeted support, and then we didn't take the full amount of the support. So I felt like the support number seemed to to be a fair number to me as to what it would cost to run a certain program and then for one reason or another at the end of the year we weren't taking that support um, and I wasn't always clear of the reasons. Um, so that I knew was a reason that we needed to look at it but I also wasn't quite sure if there we had other problems at play meaning um, are we charging too much for say full day kindergarten or some of these programs that we offer are the prices that we're charging appropriate for what the cost of the program are. And so we wanted to dig in and make sure that it wasn't more than just the support issue that I was seeing, but that there wasn't other problems at play. Could you just give the, the primer on what is a revolving fund? I'm sorry. Oh, and sure. I, we have a, just, we might have at-home audience, but I also think that I just want to make sure that I'm clearly understanding it and, um, and, you know, I understand the state allows the fund, but there's laws that require that, that set up um, certain types of funds. Like so, for instance, you have a full day kindergarten revolving fund where you can charge tuition for full day kindergarten, and there's a law that require uh, that allows you to have that, um, and then you can charge you put your revenue in there and the expenses related to running that program, and so they should pretty much be very closely aligned. You should have similar revenues and expenses. You shouldn't be building up a large balance in there. But I, I thought that part of the reason you do the revolving funds is to allow you to sort of start the, you can also start the year. So that it, I, I was never under the impression that it should like completely zero out at the end it of the year. It shouldn't be zero out, but there shouldn't be all that much in there. It, sh it shouldn't be. It's what, what had happened, and you'll see it as we get further into okay. the presentation, what had happened is they had been allowed to grow up over time, grow, to build over time to a point where we're, we were carrying much larger balances forward, which we're allowed to do legally, but we were carrying much larger balances forward than, than we really should have been. Okay. And you'll, you'll see it. Probably. And now over the last couple of years, they seem to grow. Like I think fiscal 13, there was some yeah. real change in what we ch charge for support, because um, what's happening is some of these charges are going to the general fund, and then the support is going back to the general fund. So the expenses are being charged to our general fund budget. And this revolving fund is providing support to the general fund for paying those expenses on behalf of the program. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and I think we both we both agree that primarily the buildup was the result of the support not being taken, not not the, that we're overcharging for our programs, which you'll see as we get into the presentation. Okay. So the first one that we looked at was the Rise Fund, and and. Um, I put a lot of information in here because this is a presentation that's both for you and for the Board of Selectmen, and uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were explaining um, what each fund was for. So the RISE is our preschool that's located here at the high school, and its, pr its primary focus is to provide developmentally appropriate education for um, early childhood for children with or without disabilities. So it's not just for children with disabilities. Um, although approximately half of the students in the classroom receive extra support. Um, there's a portion of the RISE expense that's going to be supported by the operating budget. It's difficult to tease out what portion of it is for students that are paying a tuition to come versus students who are here on IEPs. Um, the tuition that was billed in FY15 
was uh, approximately $290,000, and the offset that we took last year was 300000 So you can see that the tuition that we, we generated, we took that as an offset. Um, last year, and, and I'm talking about last year for our whole review, because we, we reviewed FY15 as, as part of our process. Um, there were 97 students who were enrolled, 33 of them were on IEPs, 64 of them were regular education, so 34% of the students that were in RISE last year were on IEPs. If a student's on an IEP, they're not paying tuition. Mm -hmm. um, we also offer uh, financial assistance to s residents in the district if they qualify, if they meet the federal criteria for a free and reduced lunch, they're given a discount where tuition is either waived or, or um, deeply reduced. Um, the tuition schedule, there, there's a fluctuation with what people will um, select in terms of they want three mornings a week, they want three afternoons a week, they want three full days a week, they want five mornings a week, they want, so there's a, there's kind of a cafeteria, if you will, option for, um, for selecting what, uh, what classes to enroll in. May I interject with a quick question? Sure. Is part of that driven by IEP requirements? So generally, would an IEP always require five full days or might an IEP require a different No, it, it varies by, by student, and, and Carolyn can speak yeah. to this too, but some, some students, their IEP just requires speech services, and sure. so they might only be coming in for, for speech therapy right. or OT therapy. Yeah. Um, others are more, um, more involved. More involved, yeah. yeah. Thank so. you. you know, and it varies also by um, age of the student when they're found eligible, so typically we're evaluating students initially around two and a half. So they're young, and given, and so there's a lot of factors that play into where they might fall. Right. And I appreciate that as well, because the 97 students, that was our October 1st reporting. Um, we hold slots open for children that we know are identified in the district that are going to be coming in over the course of the year. So they might join, they might turn three in January or February, and so we, we need to hold a spot for them because they're going to be coming into RISE to receive services or be included in the inclusion model there. So, so the 97 students, that was as of October 1st. I want to say, I think by the end of the year, they were up to about 100, 105 maybe. So um, the enrollment does increase. Uh, Oh, Mrs. Smith, is that just really, that just happens with the students on the IEPs, not mm -hmm. the tuition? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We would have hold a uh -huh. firm date for enrollment for, for tuition, for students, tuition okay. in students. They have to be three by the day we start. By August 31st. Yeah, by yeah. August 31st. But for students who have an identified disability, we do have a rolling admission based. Our requirement is that we each have services in place for them when they turn three, okay. whenever that is during the mm -hmm. school year. Thank you. Um, so part of our process for our review was to, um, to not just look at what we were taking for offsets, but to make sure that we were um, looking at how the program was priced, um, all of our programs. So with RISE, um, Debbie Butts had done an analysis last year when we were starting to look at our tuition rates. And so we looked at um, surrounding uh, communities and surrounding programs here in Reading. Um, part of where, what we don't want to price ourselves too high because we want to be available for Reading residents. Um, we also have the issue of our Wednesday, which is a half day. So even a even a family that's selecting a five day a week model, Wednesday is really only a half day for them on uh, because students get dismissed at uh, at noon on Wednesday from Rise. So um, we're. We're priced moderately when compared to other uh, programs. Little Treasures is a little more expensive than us. They're also a year-round program. Their hours of operation might be subtly different from ours. So um, we felt comfortable when we were looking at one of the questions that we were tasked with was, are you pricing yourselves appropriately? And we feel based on this that we are. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Our things are small. Oh, I don't okay. think it's numbers at all. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to. <laughs> if we can, um, can you maybe walk us through what, what the peers were that oh, you looked sure. at? Oh, sure. I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, so for the first one, it was um, Canterbury, which is in Wakefield. And I'm just going to focus on the five-day model. Yeah. Um, so five full days for Canterbury is about $900 a month. Um, and they're only they're, uh, they operate nine months. So their full year, the annual tuition would be um, $8,100. For Little Treasures, um, the five-day option is a little over $1,000. Um, annual, it's about 10000 
when we annualized this, we annualized it with RISE. So RISE is a 10-month program. Little Treasures is a, a year-round program. So they, they offer July and August as well. Um, but when we were trying to compare our annual number, we wanted to make sure we were comparing our annual number to an annualized number that would be comparable. Um, Reading Baptist Day doesn't have a five-day option. That's where you can see there, there are some on this list that don't have five-day options. Um, Sandra Lane Nursery does not, Sawyer Nursery. Um, the YMCA was another one that we looked at because it is local and it's here and it's available and it's a great program over there. Um, they're $1,000 a month, um, so 10000 annualized if you want to compare it to our 10-month average. And then the Goddard School, which is um, uh, here in Reading, they also have a program and they're, they were the most expensive at $1,325 a month. And what's so. Reading again? Goddard? No, what's yeah. Reading? Oh, Reading, I'm sorry. Rise. Um, we're, RISE is 750 a month. And yeah, 7,500 a year. So 7,500 annualized. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you ch select the five full day option. Mm -hmm. But the caveat there is that your Wednesday isn't really a full mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. So. I think we have to see the numbers on the next yeah. one. Yeah. Are you, were you able to see this on your slide? No. Oh, let me see if no. I can see oh, okay. it. Okay. Really really <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll uh, note to self, we'll, we'll send it to you two to a page next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so really what we wanted to do here is we, we, we took a, uh, a historical look at the data from FY11 to FY15 and then tried to have a, a, a perf purposeful forecast for 16, 17, and 18 to just to kind of show where the fund is going to go. So this one you can see that in FY11 we started with a carry forward balance of $312,000. We took in $127,000 in revenue that year, and we took a budgeted offset of $170,000 and a few other expenses. So the carry forward to the next year was, was less than the beginning balance. It, it dropped to two hundred fifty nine. dollars What you can see, hopefully you can, can you see that all okay? Yes. Oh, can, you, no. can you click it to make it bigger, like zoom it in? Is it? Okay. Yeah, that's it as big as you're going to get it. We, oh, can, okay. we can't make any bigger. Okay. Um, what, uh, what unfortunately you can't see. I, I can almost see it. <laughs> yeah, he can walk us through the bottom line number. Yeah, That's I was going to say, in, uh, <laughs> in FY13, um, we, we really didn't take a budgeted offset that, that was in any relation to what the revenue was. Um, and then that really we felt like was the, the, the primary function of why the, the fund balance was growing. Um, because revenues were like 250000 and we took offsets of... 25,000? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for FY 16, 17, and 18, we kind of, uh, we were thinking that the revenue would be somewhat consistent. It's tough to tell if, you know, by this year we have 33 students on IEPs and a certain percentage that are getting financial assistance. That can swing from one year to another and greatly impact your revenue. The other thing that, that's important to look at the revenue line, the revenue is booked when we receive it as income. Mm -hmm. So it's booked to revenue as income. There can be timing differences. If someone had a balance last year that they didn't pay until the beginning of July or mid-July, that's going to count as revenue for this year. We also do, um, we accept prepayments for people who are registering for the following year. So if a lot of people oh. prepay. Mm -hmm. So the revenue, it's, it's, it's tough to look at that revenue number and say that's just for this year's tuition because it's not. It's a combination of, of, of payments that come into the fund. I I but you can definitely see that fiscal 13 is where things start to go very much awry with what we took for support. I don't know what happened in fiscal 13, but it seems like, um, you know, we took in 250000 and then the expenses and the support that was um, taken only adds to about 57000 So there's almost 200000 just being added to the fund right there. And then in fiscal 14, um, we collected 303000 um, and we took a support of 218 other expenses also go through directly to the fund, and you've got um, 231 in being offset. So you've got another 70 there. So you're, s you're growing exponentially each year by not taking the full amount of the support. And, and to look at fiscal um, 11, you're starting this fund with, you know, we're looking at it with $312,000 um, to start with, and then we've grown it in fiscal 15 to like almost 500,000. So you're seeing that that's what's drawing the attention of the auditor because they're saying, wow, this is supposed to be a, you know, a program that's run for not-for-profit and they've, they've put 200,000 in there. What happened, you know? And it was primarily this mistaken offset that started it in fiscal 13. I don't know what the source of the mistake was. I don't know if they just didn't need it so they didn't take it or if it was just, a, I'm not sure what the problem was because I can't speak to that. 
but that's where things start to go awry, and I think that's the problem. I don't see um, a problem with what's being charged. I feel like it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And, and that was the other concern, was are we charging too much for this program? And I don't think that that is the case. I think it's it's really that when we budget a support, we need to take that support. Mm -hmm. And if we're collecting more than what that budget is, maybe it's possible that we need to take more than what we budgeted for support because this this is supposed to be helping the general fund pay for this program. And I know that there's a piece of this program that's supposed to be paid for by the general fund because mm -hmm. those IEP students are no tuition. That's a piece that's picked up by the general fund. So that's that, that was important for me to acknowledge that there's a fair amount of people who are coming through here. They're either an IEP free because of their income status or reduced. Um, and so that sort of thing um, needs to be considered because that is something that should be absorbed by the general fund. It shouldn't be charged back to the, the tuition paying mm -hmm. um, families. So n noting that the primary area where I think the problem is here is the support. If, if we're not taking the full amount the fund is going to grow. Um, and so I think Martha and I are in agreement in that area. And if we're watching that and making sure that that support happens and even taking a little bit more than what we think we're going to take for revenues because we have kind of shortchanged in those couple of years for a few years just to make it start to level off, I think that that will make a big difference. And, and keep a real good eye on what are we budgeting for support? Is it reasonable? It, is it meeting the expectations of what enrollment might be in the upcoming year and that sort of thing? Mm. And I, I think the, um, the the benefit of having had these grow now is that we do have an opportunity now to have kind of an even um, budget certainty when it comes to budgeting and planning our support. So this year we did increase the support that we were taking from RISE in this difficult budget year, but the forecast looks like we can continue to take that level of support um, over the next few years and, and slowly chip away at the, the increase that the balance uh, that the fund was able to accrue. The downside of this happening, though, I would like to mention is that when you build an um, amount of money in a revolving fund such as RISE, it has to be used for that program, and you have no flexibility to use it for anything else. Town meeting can't say, I want to take money out of this extra money out of the RISE program and use it for something else. You've lost flexibility by letting it sit in here. Free cash is a lot more flexibility. If, if we had taken the support, it would, you know, if if the general fund didn't really need it and they did take the support, it would have closed out to free cash and then you have all that flexibility about what free cash can be used for, where this is, you know, it's school related, but it's a program that you can only use it for that program. So it's gonna take some time to level it off and to make it go back the right direction. I just wanted to make mention of that. <laughs> Okay, so if I understand the numbers correctly, it looks like we reduce it by about 180, 190,000 over the next few years, and the uh, a balance then is down to 313. Uh, the starting balance right. in FY18 oh. will be 313. At the end of the year, it'll be down to 250. Down to 250. Three. Yes. Okay. And and so I think my I revenue numbers are, are yeah, a little aggressive. Okay. You know, I, I I don't know that we'll will generate two hundred eighty thousand dollars of revenue each year. Right, because that's like twenty percent more. So yeah, but you definitely have the buffer within the. Yeah, fund. yeah. <laughs> oh, because yeah, of what's happened. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. Can I ask a question about? I want to go back to something you said, Martha, which was that um, you know in a given year there could be a sudden spike, an unexpected spike in expenses. All you need is three or four kids to move yeah. into district with high needs that were federally mm -hmm. mandated to provide for. And isn't that another reason for having this revolving fund? Because it protects us in the event <coughs> of those kind of, of program needs. Am I, am I right about that? Oh, absolutely. And Sharon and I have had some philosophical conversations about what is the right amount to carry. And, and we and haven't come up with the answer yet. Yeah, the <laughs> law has been, the law doesn't give us any, any mandate on what we can But more than a year, do. I think, seems to really bring attention to it. Like yeah. I think that's what brought the attention of the auditor to look at him like, hmm, that's, you know, that's been growing. Because we talked about e equating this almost to like a circuit breaker, where with circuit breaker, we do have the ability to carry forward the current year's award, if you will, into next mm -hmm. year, and it gives us budget certainty, and, and we're, we're uh, unique. And, and I understand that, but I think that uh, some, some say a year might be too much. Too so much. it's really hard yeah. to decipher what, what is appropriate for what this is supposed to be. But I think, like I said, in fiscal 13, what we did for support was nowhere near what we took in, and that's what created the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I think it might have been fine if that not happened. So, and do you, are you both comfortable then with the projection for FY18? Does that does that number where it ends feel like about within the 12 months? Yeah, I'm yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's a smoothing effect too. So you're doing yeah. you're bringing it down gradually. 
so. So that you're not, um, when it comes to building our budgets, we're not planning on taking li this much and then they just sort of create a cliff. Yeah, like yep, a yeah, cliff absolutely. that you have. Yeah. yeah. A large so problem. we'll end up with that at, um, FY18 slightly less than a year. 253 is sort of but less than a year's revenue. Right, but I mean, yes. just in terms of, um, you know, we, yeah, we don't right. know what that mix is going to be. And, you know, we may decide we'll have three more years of experience to know whether. We should be letting that drop and know, maybe we'll below that or not. What that ideal level needs to right, be, right. you know, because there's there's got to be some slow pay. There's a lot of factors into the cash flow of right. a fund such as this. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out what is appropriate to keep in a fund such as this. And maybe we need to ask the questions of other districts. W what is typical, you know, for a fund such as this? What do you keep in there? Mm -hmm. uh, is it mm -hmm. three months? Is it six months? W what is it that you put in there? Great Maslow um. question. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. It would be <laughs> nice to just get a comparable. So, thank you. You can actually move on from this slide. Thank I you. Know, I was <laughs> say, okay. <laughs> Next up is full day kindergarten. <laughs> so, um, full day kindergarten, I as you know, we, we are required to provide um, kindergarten or education classes for our kindergarten age students, 425 hours annually. Um, we um, in FY15, we had eight full-day kindergarten classes and three integrated kindergarten classes for a total of 11, if you will, full-day uh, classes. Um, our October 1st enrollment reported we had 228 students in full-day kindergarten, which was up almost 17% from the previous year's enrollment of 195. Um, this is an interesting one, though, and this is an important one that you can see some of the swings. In FY15, we had 28 students who had their tuition waived for a combination of IEP, retention, or financial assistance compared to 35 in FY14. So that's a big difference between the number of students paying and not paying. So when you think of your FY14 enrollment of 195, 35 of those were non-paying non students versus 228, and you only have 28 students that are not paying. So it, it, it does start to swing the pendulum, if you will. Mm -hmm. When we looked at this one, this is uh, you. This is different than the rise that we were just looking at, and you guys can't see that at all, can you? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is different than the rise one that we just looked at because the operating budget is supposed to support the rise program because of the because of what it is, the nature of what it is. This half day, this second half day kindergarten, really should be supported by the tuition that we're generating. Obviously, a portion of the, of the students that are there aren't paying tuition due to IEP retention or, or financial mm -hmm. assistance. But when we looked at this, we looked at the cost of a teacher for that second half of the day. We looked at the cost of the para for that second half of the day. And then we took into account some overhead, um, where it's the principal, um, the clerical support, the nurse, the custodial staff, things like that. All those things went into the analysis of, of factoring or determining a, a tuition, if you will. Um, and our tuition should be $4,224, and we charge $4,200. So this was uh, comforting to us because this really, this thoughtful analysis hadn't been done since FY10. And, um, and it was nice to dust it off and look at it and to see that we really, it's still, the it's still things, mm -hmm. yeah. appropriate. And I think that when I was looking at this, I immediately looked to the number and says, okay, you have 11 full day kindergarten classrooms. and that's $963,000 to support. Shouldn't my support be 963? Because that's just what you go to. And the, the, the factor that there are people that don't pay for the program because they're on an IEP, that's where that additional, like we were taking a support of 830 or 840. Mm -hmm. The difference is those folks that don't pay that should be picked up by the general fund. And so this supported for me that yes, we are in the right arena for what we charge um, and what we take for support if we take the whole amount of support. <laughs> And again, just looking at the fund going forward, um, you can see that there was a, well, you might not be able to see, but there was a, no, okay. There was a, um, a jump in revenue from FY14 to FY15. Part of that was the composition of, of the, the, the class, the enrollment, if you will. Mm -hmm. Part of it could also be a function of um, what I mentioned earlier, which is you have slow payers that paid in FY15 that were really paying for FY14, and you have the incoming class for FY16, which makes their first payment in FY15. Um, so th there's a whole host of things going on in there. Um, the enrollment, 
like I mentioned before, has grown significantly from FY11 to FY16, or FY15, about 40%. Um, um, again, this is another one where the, the common theme here is FY13. <laughs> for in some reason, for some reason in FY13, we do level. Yeah. And that's where the problem starts, because the revenue, the, the, the fund grows by over $200,000 in a four-year period, so yeah. that's a lot. Um, when forecasting out the revenue and expenses, again, you know, uh, like we said with RISE, we increase the budget support for this fund from this general fund, or from this uh, revolving fund for FY16's budget, and it looks that this is healthy enough that we can take that level of support for the next few years um, easily yeah, uh, exactly and not, yeah. not impact the fund. Switching gears to special education. Um, so in FY15, we had five students from other districts that paid Reading Public Schools a tuition fee to send their children to, um, to some of our wonderful in-district programs. Um, the two that they were sending the, their students to um, were the LLD Center at uh, Eaton and at Parker, and the Compass Program had students, uh, the new Compass Program over at Coolidge. The LLD is for language-based disabilities, and the Compass Program is really for um, uh, cognitive uh, disabilities where they, they focus on academics and life skills. Tu tuitions for this have traditionally been set lower than the most appropriate other placement, other type of placement. So, and, and, um, so when thinking about that, we have traditionally tried to price ourselves a little bit lower than, than our pr you know, the most closely aligned collaborative or private school. Um, sending districts arrange for and pay for all transportation um, directly. Um, we also, uh, beginning in FY15, began charging the expense for any required one-to-one -one aids mm -hmm. um, directly to the revolving fund. So if a student who was at our Compass program required a one-to-one -one aid because of his IEP, the student was coming from another district, we weren't adding that person to our operating budget. We're charging that person directly here. So if for some reason that student doesn't return, then that uh, support wouldn't return either, and they don't become part of our operating budget. Um, this one was interesting to try and look at the analysis to, to figure out what, what is the right tuition to set, because we were going to have the Compass program at Coolidge, whether, a, whether North Reading or Malden or another district sends their student to us or not. The, the programs that we have, the LLD program, the Compass program, they're going to exist for our students. This is a, almost a, a bonus to have the room to have a student come in from another district and pay us a tuition to help offset the cost. So for the LLD program at Eaton, um, we took the, the, co the compensation for the teacher and the para. Um, we added a little bit of um, a percentage of um, utilities and materials. We added in an overhead charge for administrative purposes and came to the conclusion, based on the nine students, the average cost or the cost per student was um, $34,996. We've been charging $34,500, regardless of which program the students were coming into. We just set the tuition at that rate. Um, and um, and it, this is a tuition that we really have been increasing by about 3% every year based yeah. on the OSD guidelines. So there was really no magic to it. I, I don't know who determined the first number, but we've just been incrementally increasing by 3% for, for mm -hmm. a number of years. Um, so this was a good process for us to go to and, and look at and say, well, does it look reasonable? Same thing on the, on the Coolidge side for the Compass program. You know, when all was said and done, the Compass program, the per student cost is about 35000 36000 We're charging thirty four five. So our tuition rates seem reasonable based on the per student cost, um, but we wouldn't increase the cost to cover the cost of our program because we're going to have it anyways. It's saving us money. Yeah, it's saving us money. Because otherwise the students would go out of district yeah. for those services. Can I just clarify, so the para okay. is charged above that? Mm -hmm. In addition, so the so student would be, the tuition is the 34 or 35,000, mm -hmm. and then if, it, if their particular need required a para or a half, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so they would pay the 34,000 and then the incremental the 18 or 20 or whatever also the para is as well. Yep. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Yep. Um, so when it comes to looking at, um, wow. another one, yeah. So we also wanted to just show, okay, well, we've looked at what it costs per student. What, how is it comparable to 
where the district might want to send their student to. So for example, like a, a student from North Reading who's going to come here to our Compass program, the most appropriate uh, like program for Compass is a collaborative, and that's where um, Carolyn and I were, well, it's probably the Beattie School or the O'Grady. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we really looked at it and said, okay, well, we want to be less than those two because we don't want to price ourselves out of having someone come here if we mm -hmm. have the room. Um, and we don't want to be too close to those schools. So, so we, d we do feel like we're appropriately priced. Mm -hmm. um, same for our LLD program. There's really not a collaborative equivalent to a language, uh, providing a language-based program. Yeah. Um, really the best one would be Landmark, which is probably, you know, we've all heard of Landmark, and maybe the Carroll School was another one that mm -hmm. we thought. And so, you know, when comparing our 34,005 um, to their 46,000, Again, we, we, wanna, we don't want to price ourselves out of having students come here because it's, it's a good experience mm -hmm. for us. Can I just add in about oh, yeah. the, the para question too? If we were to send a student to one of the collaborative programs and they identify that our student needed a para to support them one-to-one, -one, we would get charged that on yeah. top on of top of this yes, yes. this is a comparable right. oh this is yeah. yes this is absolutely yeah. a comparable thank you Carol. So i just yeah. wanted to make sure yeah, i know i appreciate you guys that. understood that that's not incorporated in there oh and if that's what a team even for a private school as well if the team determines a student needs that level of support we're billed for for the one-to-one -one. One -to -one. yeah yeah that's how the, I mo uh, most often have heard like our out of district placement when we're talking about the budget we say 80 easily 80,000 yes mm -hmm. that's how you get there yeah mm -hmm. let's don't forget transportation right. right oh right so it's yeah that's right. big. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again uh, we wanted to do a thoughtful look back of the historical from FY 11 to FY 15 and then do a, a projection for 16 17 and 18 and as I, you know, we once sound like again. we sound like a broken record, <laughs> but once again, in FY13, um, there literally was no offset taken against this revolving fund, and um, and in FY14, we did take a, a minimal offset. Uh, starting in FY15, you know, mm. we we both came to the conclusion we we came. That's when things yeah. went up. Can I ask that question? What yeah. happened in 2013, and why don't we have documentation to figure out what happened? Well, it's a judgment call on the person <coughs> who was in no goal prior. And so yeah. we don't have that information of what they were thinking in terms of why they took the support or not. My assessment is that they didn't need it, that the general fund didn't need the support, so they didn't take it. That would be my assessment. Judgment call. So uh, can I? Is it, it was a judgment call on that position to decide how much support to take from these revolving funds. Somebody who actually is actively involved in planning for these programs would have to decide what the support is and decide how much is needed to support the general, general fund. That's a decision that's made by that position. But there was still a cost that, that there was. It was, charged was, was to much the general greater fund. than what we took. Yeah. So that was from our general fund, essentially. Yes. Mm -hmm. So By not taking the support, it, it, it was absorbed by the general fund. Yeah. And that's and the problem. We that are we're allowed identifying. to sort of charge back to that. Is that? I think that we got to try and catch it up. Um, but legally, you cannot take anything from I these funds it. that's not related to the program, and you can't charge there more than what it costs to run the program for the year. So you kind of it really holds the money in here, and that's why this is not a mistake we want to have happen again because the flexibility disappears. Now you can only use this money for special ed, and you could have had it close out to free cash where you would have had flexibility. Even if you didn't need it in your budget, let it close out to free cash. You're able to ask for more different varieties of expenses from free cash than you can from a revolving fund that's earmarked for special ed. I, I will say in FY16, just uh, uh, FY16, we did budget a significant amount of support from yeah. this revolving fund because we it had, a, we had over two hundred thousand dollar loss in our circuit breaker. So the this revolving fund is going to correct itself. Right away. Right away. Right away. Right because yeah. right away. So the circuit breaker went down. Yeah. yeah. Just so, so it just so happens it lucks mm -hmm. up. Yes. We have yes. Circuit breaker is, is special right. education. Right. right. Yeah. So right. so this fund is, is going to correct itself almost rather immediately. Rather quickly. Yeah, rather quickly. This is right. one of the few that we can take a large. Yeah. Um, well, you're ta we're taking two years of revenue as the offset, basically. But yes. they essentially didn't pay anything for I this right. for 13. So I just, I think you just clarified. So when you say return to the general fund, the, the issue would be, as every year, it would have been that in the school committee budget, it, it wasn't like 
taking money from the general fund, it was a matter of school committee budget closed out, and had we used the offset, there would have been more money returned to the general fund, which then at could the end of the year. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because what's yeah. happening is all the expenses of the program are being charged to the general fund, and then a support is pulled out of the revolving fund, and it comes in as a revenue support. Right, but they, they were not charged, like, in addition that year. They were, it was part of the school committee budget. It was absorbed out of the general yes, operating. Yes, what would happen is you would have the expenses budgeted in your budget. Right. But then you'd also have a line item that would be a budgeted support that would be reducing those expenses. And what's happened is you've got your expenses there. They're charged there without a problem. The support is showing a zero. So if you had, I don't know what the support might have been this year, uh, 200000 let's just say, that line item would show a negative 200000 on your budget. The actual would be zero because nothing actually got moved. And so that's where the problem mm -hmm. lies. But it does, this does have a plan to basically get that back Yes, I think it's mm -hmm. definitely going to go back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened in fiscal 13. I can only assume. I know in fiscal 14 we returned, what, almost a little more than 500000 to mm -hmm. free cash. Right, and, and to special ed. And then this year we returned a little over 220. Two, yeah, 220. So, um, you know, and this year we took the full offset in every, we took the budgeted offset in every single revolving fund, and as a result, some of we, we did return some to the town to free I cash. I think it's just a difference in how people viewed how to manage these funds mm -hmm. in terms of you know, how are they supposed to do it? How much money are they supposed to keep in there? I mean, if you're managing it and you don't have any idea that there's any reason why you can't keep money in here, you could say, well, I have enough special ed funding within my general fund. I don't need it this particular year. I need it for later. Maybe I want to build this up so I have budget certainty. I could see the thought process that might have gone into mm -hmm. doing this, but it's not really allowed, and that's what we're trying to highlight, so. Uh, the last of the funds that we want to cover tonight is extended day. And so extended day includes both before and after school programming uh, at each of our elementary schools. Um, Sandy Calendrello, the director, runs a wonderful program, as you can see from the participation in FY11 of 167 kiddos to 437 in a waiting list at all five elementary schools. Um, so growth was capped by capacity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 9% uh, increase? Yeah, we, we seem to still see it more. Oh, <laughs> it, it also <laughs> get staffing. Yeah, that, that's where we're at. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. That, that's where we're at this year. We, we can't add more without adding more staffing uh -huh. for supervision of the students. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the hours, Sandy has a wonderful staff, but, you know, it's, it's tough to find people that want to work those hours. They're, they're not really mother's hours. Mm -hmm. so. They're before and after it's the mother's staff. hours when they don't right. want to work. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the student's schedule and what they sign up for in terms of before school or after school varies greatly depending upon the family's individual needs. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the t participation has grown exponentially. Um, tuition is billed on a monthly basis in a program that we have called eSchool. And families can either pay online using a credit card or an ACH, or they can send in checks. So if you can figure, you know, you get 437 families that are participating, 10 months of invoicing, that's over $4,000, well, 4,000 payments that are coming through to be processed. So it's, it's a little labor intensive when it comes to um, supporting this program. When we were trying to look at um, how we're priced and whether we're priced appropriately, it was difficult to look at our monthly rate compared to other programs. So to compare our monthly rate to the Y or to uh, surrounding communities, we looked at Melrose and we looked at Stoneham um, and we looked at North Andover because North Andover was one of our comparable communities from our budget book. So that seemed like a reasonable comparison. Um, we really have to look at the number of service hours, if you will, because we have a half day on Wednesday. <coughs> and so we're providing more service hours in our five day a week option than some of these other surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. So pricing was best compared on an hourly rate. And when you look at our hourly rate, Redding's program is priced at $6.07 an hour compared to Melrose, which is $6.75, compared to Stoneham, which is $6.55. And North Andover comes in at the lowest at $5.44 an um, uh, hour. The Y was, uh, the Y structures theirs a little bit differently. They charge more f if you're sending a kindergarten age student versus uh, grades one through five. So their kindergarten hourly rate was $6.89 and their grade one through five hourly rate is $5.87. So when we were talking, we really felt like 
the, the, rate. the rate is appropriate. We're not overcharging for this program. It's really been a function of, um, of, of staffing and of, of needing more supports for it. Um, we believe the, the funding, the, the fund has grown due to a lack of staffing, if you will. Um, so for extended day, again, this one was tough to look at the revenue because there, there's a lot of things that might get paid this year or prepayments. When you have a, a, a jump in, in, um, in participation year over year and you're getting those prepayments in, you know, we, our revenue for FY15 was over a million dollars. Um, another thing that's factoring into this is, I want to say, was it, Craig, was it FY10 when Sandy took over one of the after-school fund programs from the PTO? I, I can't remember which elementary school it was. She took over for a pilot. The PTOs used to run programs FY in all of our... 13. Was it 13? FY13. FY13, thank you. Um, she took over running for at one school, a model, to, to absorb the, the after-school fund program from one of the PTOs. And she did such a good job that the next year she had all five elementary schools. So that is also uh, contributing to the increase in revenue. It's not just extended day anymore that's coming into this revolving fund. It's it's the five elementary after school programs that are that are coming in here now as well. Um, so the FY16 forecast includes um, <coughs> for expense includes some administrative positions that are going to be before the committee tonight. And I know Craig, uh, Mr. Martin wrote a memo on that. And we'll talk about that later in the meeting. Um, and Extended Day is currently go undergoing a comprehensive review to really determine what are the needs for future programming. Um, we have wonderful programs, enrichment programs that come in on Wednesdays for the, the kids that are there. Um, and, and I know we, we look to continue to invest in the program. I think we feel comfortable that the tuition or the fees are set appropriately. It seems like they're, they're appropriate for exactly comparables and, and such. The problem I feel like here is that as it grew so quickly, I don't think that they've bulked up the staff um, to match what the revenues were, um, and I think that's what's building. And so there's an opportunity here to enrich the program, to add staff to help manage the receipts, the billing. It's a lot of volume. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's hard to imagine that the director sits down and processes those payments and um, bills and stuff when we're talking 4000 a year. So yeah. there needs to be at least a, an administrative staff, at the very least added, in my opinion, um, to process this. Um, <coughs> because she needs to be planning the programs, and she's spending far too much time Mm -hmm. processing payments and uh, you know just looking at the enrollment and how it increased so quickly um, she didn't have time to plan really she's too bus she's too busy processing payments <laughs> and bills <Yeah. laughs> um, so I think that that's the primary problem here is that we need to hire more staff so that the program can be more enriched and she can plan better programs um, and I think that that's the problem here because there's not as much support. You see that this compensation to the people working in this program is charged directly here. It's not mm -hmm. charged to the general fund. So this isn't the same problem as we're seeing with the other three. It's not a support problem. There is some support that's being charged here, but it's not mm -hmm. the people working on the program. It's that there's just not enough people working this program. That's what it seems to me. That's where I, f I feel the problem is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I concur. And so in summary, <laughs> um, after a thorough review of, of the four largest revolving funds, it really does appear that the, the buildup of the fund balance was the result of not taking the full support in one particular year. Um, both of us worked collaboratively to ensure that going forward, uh, projected revenues and expenses are closely aligned. Mm -hmm. um, we have put in place that we will take the budgeted support unless there are mitigating circumstances, and that would be by a vote of the school committee if we were going to do anything other than what the budgeted support was intended to be for that year. And um, if you're fully aware of what yeah. you're taking as a support, especially where it's been highlighted, you really should be mm -hmm. kind of asking that question, what are we taking support? What do we budget? What are we taking? Be very aware. You know, just we don't want it highlighted again. It, it's certainly not... Um, a reflection of how well we do here in Reading, and I don't want to see any other negative mark against us. It, it was it was definitely just a poor judgment in that fiscal 13 that started the ball rolling in the wrong direction. Um, and I feel like it, it was a good learning opportunity for me as well to get into these revolving funds and learn about 
how they run and what kind of things cause it to look, you know, like when I was looking at that full day kindergarten, I said, geez, the costs are 963. Why are you not taking 963,000 as support? There are real reasons why you don't take that. It is general fund expense. It should stay on the general fund. So learning about them, that was a very important part of the process for me is, is to learn about the things that weren't obvious on the onset, looking at it, just looking on it on paper. What are the problems here? Asking those questions. And that will be ongoing with Martha and I so that we can continue to keep these going in the right direction. Just because I do feel like, you know, we really dug deep to find out what's wrong here. <laughs> um, and we spent a lot of time, and I don't think that's going to stop because we don't want to have this problem revisited. So, yeah. Yes. So are there other, what did you say there were other revolving accounts that, or were These are the young? primary ones that we're focused on. Um, okay. We started with the biggest ones, um, and we can look at others if there are others that are. No, I didn't know the town, if there were any of the, I'm thinking of sort of the. When I asked that we approve the town meeting all the time. Yeah, we have, oh, oh, I'm not sure. I mean, we have a number, we have athletics, extracurricular, I mean, we have a lot of revolving Oh, you mean the clubs. revolvings that we, we, that we support every That we approve at town meeting. Yeah, Those I just are smaller. Know they yeah, they're not, oh, um, they're the not. Have, have to be annually approved. They have to be yeah. annually yeah. approved. Yeah. Their spending limits, those are much smaller funds, um, and those are, were not highlighted as issues. There is one large um, revolving fund within the town that has been declining over the last few years, but it's still kind of large. So I'll be looking closer at that, but it's still, um, when I asked the auditors what was their area of concern, it was primarily these four um, mm -hmm. that they okay. saw just jump up all of a sudden, and, and it just highlighted their concern. Good. Um, you know, I, I want to thank you both for this presentation and for the amount of work that you've done on it. Um, you know, right before you presented, we heard our CASA, and we talked about the importance of the community working together and how it works best, and I think you are really showing an example of how the schools and the town side can work together to solve a problem. So I'm very appreciative of that um, spirit of collaboration that you brought to this project. I wanted to ask about the, the last bullet there. Any change to the budgeted school revolving fund support will be approved by the school committee. How does that get enforced? I, I always worry about the future when a few of us are no longer on the school committee and maybe, uh, you know, we have well, I'm going to be more aware of asking more questions. I think before I kind of, um, I would ask questions, but it was the school committee's budget. And so if, if it was being approved, I, it was kind of like well, they know what they're doing. Um, and now that something's been highlighted, I'm going to ask a lot more questions. I'm going to be pushing back. So I'll probably be the person that would be asking and pointing it out to somebody over on this side, whether it be, Martha or the school committee if, if the, num the number isn't in line with what I think. We typically book our support um, in late June yeah. is when we, we book it and that um, there's no reason not to just book what's budgeted now because that's that's kind of what we've yeah, agreed I to. I mean I remember the first year I was here um, for the town side you know shortly after I closed the year I, I said oh, I'm going to book, book the current year's support Would you? and I asked Mary would you like me to book yours? She said no. I'll tell you when to book it because we don't always need it all. I didn't fully understand what that meant. And there could be variances such as we have all these IEP people. You know, those are the things that c she could have been referring to, but it was her budget and I let her do her thing because she'd been here a long time. And she knew the reasons behind the budget that she was using and so I didn't question it much. So back, in th back then I think we took our support in the beginning of the year and the school was taking it at the end when they had more information, maybe about enrollment or whatnot. Um, and now, it, given our agreement, I think we could do it um, in the beginning when I'm doing mine. Just book the entry and you'll know well in advance that the support has been provided to the general fund for the current year's budget. So just to, to just follow that up, so it sounds to me, Martha, that you're making essentially a change in how your office mm -hmm. will handle this going forward. So it'll yes. become part of the new protocol. Yes. That's, that's, I guess, what I was asking. Yes. So uh, this doesn't seem to write, this doesn't strike me as a school committee policy, but I wanted to make sure that there was a protocol change that was going to happen that will help protect this mm -hmm. from happening yes. again. Mm -hmm. we, we decided uh, as part of our response to the audit comment that any changes to the budgeted offset would be brought to the attention of the school committee, whether it's by vote or just uh, you know, at a meeting saying, well, the budgeted offset was 330000 and due to enrollment this year, we're not in a position to take that much, and so, or we need to take more because of what happened. So any conversations about, about deviating from what was in the budget would be had with the school committee. 
And that's what I think the predecessor was doing is seeing where she was enrollment wise and figuring out what the support should be, so. I, I think there's two important questions to ask each year. When, when the superintendent's recommended budget comes out and we're showing the offset to the budget from these revolving accounts, the first question to ask is this is an appropriate amount based on the data that we have. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, when we're doing our final budget uh, report to you, the question that should be asked is, did the offsets that were approved in the budget all be taken out? I'll get back to you. And I, I think those are the two key questions. And if yes. not, why? You know. Right. Because <coughs> there could be justifiable reasons why not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can yeah, I, I mean, as a, I think historically it's been viewed as a, 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 a way to balance the budget. Now we've got to be a lot more judicious in, mm -hmm. in that Correct. decision. Yeah. yeah. So, so I just wa wanted to clarify. So this, um, I think because I was starting to feel a little hot. <laughs> um, I, we've been really transparent. This is not about the school committee's overall budget process. And you certainly, a as any member of the school committee or any member of the town, has always been invited into our process. So I just want to make sure that I the don't concern. Think it's a school committee problem, no. No, or, well, we have some really capable people here, and I, I just, this seems to, this is very specifically focused on how we handle this offset, then, as, mm -hmm. and, as Mr. Robinson I think that we're to. all aware we're all going to be looking for this problem not to be revisited. If we budget a certain amount of support, we see it going through um, right. our budgets. And if we're not doing it, we have a very good rationale and reason for that may mm -hmm. relate to the current year or an I'm expectation be about for future it. I'm sure years. Martha will be looking for it that we appropriately um, book the entry to show that support. Mm -hmm. But it's just something you should be aware of as well, you know, because it okay. could come before you a reason why we won't take the support. Enrollment is not what we expected. That there's reasons why we can't afford to take the support. And you would want to probably plan for that because now that's going to be less support in a budget that's already relying on that support and you need mm -hmm. to make some adjustments. So it's just part of that overall conversation that needs to happen if there is some reason that you can't take the support that you were hoping to take for that year. So will, will we be doing the offset, taking the offset in the beginning of the year going forward? We can. We can. I, I, I would probably wait and take it in June just because um, there could be some, of, some of our um, some of our funds are replenishing as the year goes on. So athletics is on a cycle to collect fees three times a year. Right. So yeah, I wouldn't want to book the whole offset yeah. at the beginning of the year because then the fund <coughs> would be depleted. Yeah. That so that that's that's that might that's be some of the timing on why we wait and until the end of the year. Of it as well. so yeah. I was yeah. just thinking th these particular four that are problematic. The I know the athletic, ones, yeah. but the athletic yeah. department account pretty much zeroes out every year, pretty much, I believe. So, but this these haven't. So I don't know if it makes yeah. sense to take the offsets in the beginning just to make sure we're doing it right. And then backing off and the offset if it if it turns out that it's not the yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, as right. part of when you do your report at the end of the year and say, you know, we're repatriating this much to mm -hmm. free cash, we can identify that it was because we didn't use all of the uh, kindergarten offset or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, to, which we haven't done in the past. We just talk about the overall number. We mm -hmm. should be clear that it was because we didn't use an amount of an offset is that mm -hmm. really yeah. what they're I mean, looking for? If there's a reason we projected enrollment for a certain program and it's not what we hoped and it would jeopardize that fund to take that full amount of support, mm -hmm. that would be a reason not yeah. to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. see Barry was here tonight, so is oh, any of us going need to be there? Um, I believe next on our agenda is approval of new positions, which sort of somewhat follows very I logically <laughs> 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 of that conversation. Sometimes it goes across. It's really nice when the town accountant comes in and says, the problem is you're not spending enough money. <laughs> um, Mr. Martin, are you going to be leading us through this, or Dr. Doherty? I, Mr. Martin can okay. lead on the two extended day. Okay. Um, and then Martha's going to talk about, and I, and I can fill in two on the data and analyst. Great. So as you see, I presented a memo um, to the committee um, as 
Martha alluded to that we are asking you to approve two new positions, um, administrative type of positions. One is a registration coordinator and one is a billing specialist, both for the extended day program. Um, as, as they just highlighted, I mean, we've just had tremendous growth over the last few years. Um, it's really outpaced our, our staff. Um, so we feel these two positions are the first step. Um, I've been talking with our staff, our director, and I've asked them to begin sort of a comprehensive overview of the program. So, and we're looking at all aspects of it, not just um, the structuring and staffing and costs and so forth, but also how we can enhance the program. Clearly this is responding to a need in our community, as we've seen in the last four years. Um, and we're really excited about some ideas to enhance the program. Um, so we feel that these two positions, though, are the immediate first step in that for us to be able to do that. <coughs> are, there some other, are there some questions, or do you want me to explain some more about how that, I think we also in, um, included the job description. Why don't I, uh, we'll put a motion on the table so we can discuss. Yeah. Um, move to approve the position of registration coordinator to support the extended day program. Were there any questions? Uh, I just had a comment just as a point of preference as a parent who uses the extended day program in the morning at Joshua Eden. Um, I have seen the I have seen the program grow in last year. I didn't quite get my registration in on time. And <laughs> <laughs> I was on a waiting list and um, they do an excellent job and the numbers have grown. And these two positions that you're seeking are one hundred percent necessary in my opinion as someone who uses the program. I think they will just greatly enhance it. Have just not only the administration of the program, but just that communication with community as the enrollment has gone up. I mean, it's essentially grown to the size of about one of our schools, maybe right. even a little larger. Right. And that's a lot of interaction and communication and questions and payments and so forth. That's awesome. So, yeah, exactly. I guess I would add to that. Um, I, I hope that as you're um, looking at the overall program and thinking about what it could be, um, great opportunity again to reach out to parents. I've certainly heard. You know, the periodic conversation, oh, wouldn't it be great if they offered this, or I wish they had that. So it's a great chance to talk to parents, say, what do you wish your kids had access to after school? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that would be nice, too. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, um, having been the director of community education and also done the driver's education registration and tracking all the hours and scheduling, that was a lot of work. And that alone could, could justify, if the program grows to the extent it used to be, um, and it was a great program, I'm really confident it will become uh, as good as it used to be, if not better. Uh, anyways, it's um, totally the support of them. Awesome, thank you. So um, can I just, two questions. So I, I guess I'm not familiar with what the current staff is, so is there just the director, basically? Is there just the one person now? There's uh, the director and there's a, a site coordinator, right, who, who goes to all the five sites. A director and, and a site coordinator. And that, we actually had three positions when the program first started. And uh, no, actually, we added a position. Mm -hmm. Then we cut the mm -hmm. position. So our staffing has remained mm -hmm. at a level of two. Well, we've had the double digit growth. Right. So um, where and where are the staff located? Where, where are these positions going to be located? Mm -hmm. Here, like, are we losing part of our conference room? No, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. We're, we're <laughs> using. We are starting to use every nook and cranny in this office. <laughs> okay, and is the okay. So that's so they are co-located then with the director. Yes. And yeah. It's all this all area out here is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I also want to clarify. Am I right to understand that this program has absorbed? the after-school programs that used to be offered by the PTOs, right. like the Killam Koalas and the Jaguar yes. program. And yes. So this, mm -hmm. those are no longer being run by. That is correct. <coughs> they, they were finding that they just couldn't get the volunteers to sustain those programs. A lot of time. Mm -hmm. A lot of very devoted yep. volunteers ran those programs. Plus now you use the school liability insurance. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Is these amounts are, uh, include benefits and is that or is that on top of it? Because we should. No, it does not include. It does not. Where are they now? Are they in the motion? They're in the job description. In the job description. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, they're getting paid benefits, correct? Or they will be. I don't 
Did we put it? No, down? I don't think there is an analyst. You're analyst. thinking of the data analyst. Data analyst, yeah. yeah. Right. That's that's the next position. Okay. Sorry. But that actually brings up a good point. I mean, are there impacts to the town side budget in accommodated costs that we need to be concerned with? Or is this all out of the revolving fund? It's all out of the revolving fund. Even okay. But they're full-time positions. Yes. yes. And oh wait, they don't have benefits? No, they, they do. Yeah, they they do are benefit-eligible positions. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you said they didn't. But I was like, wow, wait a minute. It's only a question of where their money comes from. Yeah, right. But, but the money will come from the revolving account. Yeah. The not, 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 not for the benefits. benefits. We've not taken benefits in the past out of revolving account. Should we, though? We, we have not in the past in any program. Right. Should we consider that, though? I think that's a greater conversation. That's is it, it opens up a big, bigger conversation. But I think it's a conversation to consider, though. Well, but we can. I, do we? You don't do that. But aren't, isn't that all in the uh, yeah, you accommodated costs, even for the staff? The t the uh, like any of these positions. I, th I think you can't just do it for one. Yeah. Agreed. So it. And you also have to look at it for grants. You have to look for everything then. And that, that reduces your capability of doing some things with your grants if you do that. I know, I'm very familiar with grants. And generally, my experience is you can, either way, you can use that as, you know, um, in-kind support. Or you can pretty much take it all out of the grant. And I understand the ramifications of it. But I think it's something to consider, if, if, if particularly with the revolving accounts. Sounds like it, it would be a big process. If you start including benefits, it will affect all the charts that you saw tonight, which could affect what you also charge. Because if you start including benefits, you're going to end up charging more money. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to take as much of the offset anymore because you're not going to have as much left in the, in the revolving account. And that would represent a real shift in how we've always handled it. And we've not done that in the past. That's, we have a pretty established process with the town and accommodating right. costs. That, that, that really would be a huge conversation. I think. Most of our community our, um, extended day positions are not benefit positions. I mean, these are, but because they, they mostly are, uh, most, of, most of our staff are, uh, work during the day, so they already qualify for benefits. We motioned and seconded. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Sorry. <laughs> Six zero. Uh, move to approve the position of billing specialist to support the extended day program. Second. Any questions on that? Do you want to be just? To, I mean, that's exactly as it reads there. Um, it was talked about earlier that the amount of um, accounting work processing has just grown tremendously also. Um, and this will get somebody who can specialize in that area and allow the director and other positions to work on during the program development stage. Am I right to assume that this position will also be able to help when it comes to budget time? in terms of figuring out what budgeting is needed and, and figuring out next year's budget. So it will, it will budget for extended day, yes, or, or assist with that, yes. And what, but there's, we don't take a large offset from extended day. The offset that we take from extended day is a, a small one for the Utilities. central office. And then the, uh, we added a $50,000 offset this year for rental fees and utilities. So. There's not a lot of offset, as Sharon and I said earlier. This fund, all the expenses are charged to it, whereas the other ones, they're charged to the operating budget, and we take an offset. Right. So, another benefit I think of this kind of thing is the redundancy it builds into the organization. So right now you have one person processing all those payments, and I think it's smart to think about you know, what happens if anything ever happened to that person. Right. Uh, you know, any sort of crisis that pulled them out of the office for several weeks, who now can do that job? Now we'll have two people on staff who can do that job. So I think that redundancy is just smart mm -hmm. when we can have it. What are the salaries for these two positions? I know for the, the billing <laughs> specialist, we were thinking in the forty-five to $55,000 range, depending on experience and, and, and education. The, uh, 
registration coordinator. Yeah, I mean, we haven't pinpointed yet, but we were talking about the same range. I would just have to say that I think the job descriptions are really well written and that um, I, mean, I think, you know, the required skills and knowledge, the education, I think they're, but I think it's well written. I appreciate that because it's important to, you know, pr protect us. We can't get the people that we want at the level that, and have them expect them to operate at the level we need if the job description isn't well written to start. So. Mm -hmm. Those in favor? Carol. Okay, Mr. Chair, move to approve the grant analyst position to be funded by the School Climate Transformation Grant. Data analyst. Second. Data analyst. Data analyst. Oh, data analyst. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Oh, so this position is. Year, Linda. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this position is a new position. So with the School Climate Transformation Grant, as you know, it, was, it had an award date of October 1st. And, um, and uh, we were not unique in a lot of other districts that received this grant funding. Um, it took time to get up and running and, and get things in place and processes going. So we have a, a carryover, if you will, of about $90,000 from year one that carries into year two. And um, Sarah Bird and I had a conversation with our grant uh, contact a couple weeks ago, just kind of vetting out this idea of, of a full-time data analyst that the grant, I think, was initially written with a full-time, and, and we, we, we kind of parsed that back to a 0.25. Yeah. And, and really, we're finding that the, the need is there for we're data. We're regretting that yeah. we mm -hmm. didn't keep it at full-time. Yeah. And so um, Sarah and I reached out to a couple of communities that have data analysts on staff to get their job descriptions, find out what the salary range was, and so that we had some basis of a comparison. And, uh, and we feel comfortable with the description and, and the sixty to $70,000 range. Um, you know, my memo alluded to that eventually the, that we're going to start tearing back the support for this, and it will come onto the operating budget. Um, the School Climate Transformation Grant is not subject to the supplanting laws and, and regulations, so um, there's, not a, there's not a concern about using it to support it now, knowing that it's coming back onto the operating budget. So I don't know if you have any other questions about the position or? If I can just add a couple of things. Yeah, um, so this is something that I think you've seen in the presentations to the community mm -hmm. is a much needed position for <coughs> measuring the data, um, for behavioral health, MTSS work, which does include academic interventions as well, um, to give our principals and other staff the, the information that they need to make good decisions on programs and policies and on how we can restructure things to help students. Um, right now, it's being done when time is available by a variety of different administrators. And that's the bottom line. So the so the point two five is could be that you're using now. You just said uh, well, right now is we're using a piece of one of our technicians to provide that service. Okay. Um, and what we're finding is it's just not enough time. Is so. I mean, this this is a pretty detailed uh, job description. Does this person exist out there that has all? There are other school districts that, that we actually took job descriptions from other school districts and made the one that made the most sense for us. Um, so these positions are becoming more and more common in school districts. I was just going to mention that, that it's not unusual to see a data analyst in a school district with all the data that's going to be the big thing is what are you going to do with all that data once you've got it. But um, it's important to have someone to come and analyze it because it's it can't be done by uh, classroom teachers or principals. Right. They don't have the time to do it. It's, it's, they need to have someone come in and say, here's your data. And you know that's when the PLCs can essentially say, OK, here's what we're going to do because of this data, much like youth risk behavior survey data. <coughs> so I just want to make sure I understand. I, I totally support this position. I think I've been, I'm just amazed that we can get anything done without having this kind of a position. But so I just want to be clear. So it looks so the grant it will be funded through the grant um, this year and in years three to five. I, yeah, I think I think what we're going to start trying to do. I mean, at, at some point, if this is a successful position, you'd like it 
to be funded after the grant expires. I, I absolutely think so. That we that may that start. You may. We may start doing a, a split. Um, oh, okay. You know, depending on how grant funding goes, depending on how our operation budgets go. You know, a fraction comes out of the operating budget, and we start weaning it um, out of the grant over years three to five. But right. So that it's I mean, not. I think that's going to be subject to. That would help us manage the transition right. of this needed position back into the operating budget. Okay, that's good. Correct. Thank you. I just want to add my voice to the extreme support for this position. I think we strive to be a data-driven district. I think there's general agreement that we want to be making our decisions based on data, and um, we can't do it without somebody to help us do that. And I think the conversations are richer and more meaningful, and they become less about opinion and subjective um, um, points of view, and more about what, is, what do we know about our kids factually, what can we really say. I think it's going to lead to better decision making. Um, I think it's integral to the implementation of MTSS. I'm just incredibly supportive of this position. Those in favor? I was just going to say that I, I agree that it's really important to um, have this resource to parse the data, but I it's kind of predictable that I'm going to say that we also, there's the data is one bar, and then there's also qualitative data as well that we learn, and that also has its place in our assessments. So I don't want, I don't think this supplants that, um, but they can work very well in tandem to give our kids and our schools the best program. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yeah, that's exactly where we are. Reports. Carl, did you have a report? Yes, I did. Since you hung around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, by the way, I, uh, Alex was at the event I was at, so you, she, she's my uh, alibi that I was there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, as Ms. Rob said, the Field Hockey Senior Night was tonight. Um, tomorrow night, the girls' soccer team has their senior night. And on Friday, the, the football team has their senior night as we take on Arlington for the Middlesex League title. The Drama Club is putting a, um, presenting Mary Poppins November 6th through the 15th of November. Um, the OMHS Club called um, Girl Rising presented the documentary also called Girl Rising on RCTV. Um, very uh, recently, and an all just the French exchange students are here. They were here every day, like the Swiss kids last year were here like every day. These kids like um, visit places here every day, but we've seen a couple of them uh, in the past week or so. They were at the football game the other night, I saw some of them. I was, mm -hmm. oops, mine's really quick. Um, I gave this report, but it is very timely. A week from Wednesday, the Recreation Committee, uh, along with local businesses um, in Town Hall and the Senior Center, are doing the downtown trick-or-treat Wednesday afternoon. Um, so definitely, if you've got little ones, get them down there. And if you like fun times, just go down there. It's really fun. <laughs> yes. I had said earlier, I attended the, uh, the team panel on social media uh, last week, and it was very, very well attended. And it was very well done. The students that volunteered their time and their mm -hmm. honesty, um, it, it, it gave us parents a lot of good information. I will say that um, a large uh, portion of the audience were middle school parents. So I would love to see, and I mentioned this to one of the women running the program, to see a similar um, event with middle school children in mind. It just, you know, it, it gives us a different perspective. But it was, I was so encouraged to see all the people that came out. It was nice. Just a thought to add to that too. I think it's a very effective way to communicate issues that students are dealing with, but I think it could be expanded to into other areas besides just social media. But I think that, that can be eye-opening to parents, some of the concerns that students might have. We spoke tonight about risky behaviors. That could be a, a topic in itself that I think would have an impact. Back to the parents. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, just one more comment about the um, panel. I just want to give a shout out to the Rocket Desk 
class, that's who, um, where the kids emanated from with um, Janet D and the other technology integration <laughs> specialists. Um, so it was awesome to see them in another, we saw them last year present to us and I now tweet because they wrote out the instructions and helped me. So just mm -hmm. a big thank you and a big shout out for them. Um, Human Relations Advisory Committee, I just wanted to say that our next meeting is October 29th, which is not the usual first Thursday of the month because of a conflict. Um, but following that, we will be back to the first Thursday of every month. So October 29th is the next meeting. And then the Human Relations Advisory Committee will be presenting for the selectmen on November 3rd as well. So, and again, everybody is invited to our meetings. Please come. Seven o'clock at the um, police station in the community room. I know I mentioned it once. I'm just gonna say um, one more time that the, um, Dr. Hill is gonna be here on the 29th, which is next Thursday. And so in line with sort of encouraging the community and trying to get um, really good participation, I would think, given the youth risk behavior survey, and um, he, his talk is related to the book, Marijuana, The Unbiased Truth About the World's Most Popular Weed. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's lots of, pe people can agree or disagree about whether it's a gateway or not. but. The there's facts that show that kids are um, trying it and using it. Um, so I really want to encourage people to attend. And then the 28th, as uh, after the Halloween thing, is the Financial Forum. Is that still right on the calendar yes. there? Yes. yes. Uh, the 28th of October, right, at 7.30. And do we know where it is, actually? Is it in the Senior it's Center? It's at the Senior Center. Okay, the Senior Center. So. At least um, maybe send the kids home with someone else and then come. <laughs> and some <laughs> kids. Financial forum. Financial forum. <laughs> we, will we get a uh, something from the town manager, a preview of that? Or? Um, yes, I, ho I hope so. Yes, I believe so. I believe. Can't remember. Can we have like this? And then Craig. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to, I have three things I wanted to update you on. Um, first is on the POST program, which is going very well. Um, they've started internships and, and they're interning, interning at um, uh, Full Circle Earth, which is in Beverly. At the Rise Preschool, we have some students here and then at a local thrift shop and they're doing cycles through that. They're also working with a self-defense organization called IMPACT that's coming in to do work with individuals with disabilities. And they have their van, so they are out and about in the community. So overall, it's, it's been very positive. Um, uh, in regards to the Special Ed Parent Advisory Council, we are meeting next Monday, um, October 26th at seven o'clock right here. Um, we're encouraging all families, um, whether they have a child with special needs or not to come out to the meeting. The purpose of this is really a meet and greet. I'm gonna review some of the Walker report and introduce staff to families, but the, the CPAC is really an opportunity for networking and support, and we hope to grow a group, a leadership group, that can provide feedback to myself, to the school committee, on special ed policies and programs, and how we're doing around special ed. Um, I have meetings scheduled and I've sent them out. Um, my mailing was a little delayed. Um, so we've been trying to communicate um, both on our website and Dr. Doherty had sent out some information as well this weekend and a couple of parents have reached out to me as well and I've been responding to that. Um, and then the third thing is that on October 13th, we had a professional development day. So I just wanted to report mm -hmm. out on some of the activities that um, have more of a student services spin. So we provided QBS, which is our restraint training. So um, if you recall over the summer, we talked about our new restraint policy. We use that day to do recertification and also the initial first day of the initial certification for 40 staff members. Um, we also had a, a 60 adults participate in youth mental health first aid. That included all of our nurses from each building as well as paraprofessionals. Um, we had a training for 20 staff that was targeted at middle and high school on transition and student-centered planning. Maria Pio 
Kowalski from the Institute for Community Inclusion from UMass Boston. She um, is an expert in this area and did a full day um, series with special ed teachers and team chairs. And we used funds that had been gifted to us from Samantha's Harvest to pay for this opportunity for our staff. Um, we also ran a session, two half day sessions on understanding language based learning disabilities with Adam Hickey from Landmark School. This is a kind of beginning kickoff um, to help support our language based programs this year. So we had about 35 staff from middle and high school and 25 staff from um, elementary participate in that. We had our paraprofessionals received either attended a training with Allison Breer Farrell, one of our team chairs on effective inclusion strategies, or they worked with Lisa Studer, our BCBA, for about an hour and a half. We also had some training from our speech pathologists and OTs for our paraprofessionals. And then Alan Bloom, who has been working with us since last uh, February, um, he's a retired professor, professor from Simmons, and he's been working with us on effective inclusion strategies and IEP writing, and he ran sessions for the high school, middle school, and elementary staff, um, about an hour and a half, two hour sessions, to help them understand the intersect between general education and special education, and some um, effective strategies <coughs> for inclusion. And we also provided op open circle training for some of our specialists. So that was just on my. Wow. Day. <laughs> that was just my, and I know Mr. Martin has other things that were offered as well. <laughs> I do, I actually have, um, I have handouts for my report, so I apologize, but uh, here they come. The first one is, um, is uh, it, it's Christmas in October mm -hmm. for me, it's budget season. <laughs> so, Thank you. Um, so this is a draft of the, um, the budget calendar. Oh my goodness. I know, yeah. isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to walk through the entire calendar. I'll just hit some highlights, and, and um, you just hit one of them for me, the financial forum that's coming up on October 28th. Um, our goal, we're going to have ongoing discussions, as we have been having ongoing discussions with the community about priorities. Um, the superintendent's recommended budget will be finalized by December 30th to be distributed by the 31st. As in, um, prior, as in last year, um, feedback from you all be wonderful, but I, I think that the having the questions to us uh, a few nights before the cost center was to be presented allows us time to incorporate any answers into our presentation. Obviously, every question that you all submit will be answered, um, so it, it, the timing of it is, is at your preference and your availability. Um, the budget uh, presentations will have start on January 7th and go over four nights. Um, public input will be on the 21st, and right now, tentatively, the vote on the budget is for January 25th. Um, there's a, another financial forum scheduled on January 20th, and then the third one is March 23rd. Town meeting is scheduled right now for the 28th of April, um, and then May 2nd or the 5th as needed. I don't know if there are any questions on the calendar. I have a question. Yeah. When is the, w if the plan is to vote on January 25th, isn't mm -hmm. there like a drop, isn't there a date after that where it's really essential that the budget be voted on or else? February 1st. February 1st is the date. It has to be the town manager by February 1st. Thank you. That's what I said. So. Thank you. So there's a little bit of so wait, where five days window. So our vote is on the 21st. Right now it's scheduled for the 25th. Public mm -hmm. input is scheduled okay. for the 21st. And there's a. FinCom meeting in there somewhere. Oh, March. there is. There's a FinCom meeting on January 20th. No, March 16th. Uh, that's after you've approved the budget. No, that's the one. That's, that's when we present to the we finance, finance committee. committee. Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, the next hint. So I have one more report. I'm handouts again. Sorry. <laughs> the next one is um, just to give you um, an update on expenditures um, for the modular school project. And this one is a little, um, a little more detailed. It, it has um, what we've spent with, with various vendors on the project. Um, and to give you an update where we are with, um, with available funds. So all three uh, sites have received their, um, their certificate of occupancy. Um, they were initially given um, temporary, 30-day temporary occupancy. All, all three sites now have, have certificate of occupancy. 
Um, there are small punch lists of items that they've been um, working through, you know, um, from adjusting the speed of the bathroom doors to, um, you know, touching up some exterior cleanup and, and painting and whatnot. Um, I do think that the silt socks might still be yeah. at a couple of the sites. Um, conservation has reached out to us and, and to Vanguard and asked them to keep them in place until the grass takes. Um, so, so it could be a little bit of time before the silt socks are removed. Um, but um, as you can see, obviously the, the most most of our expenditures went with Vanguard with the contract for the for the actual units and the site work. Um, there's an AIA change order in the in the process right now um, that will give us a $15,000 credit. Um, that was worked through uh, about a week and a half ago, and, and we're working on a, a final um, uh, settlement document with Vanguard through our attorney, and that will be, that will be finalized in the next week or so, um, hopefully. Uh, the next largest expenditure was with our OPM, uh, the services. Uh, it, it did go over, we initially had thought around 60,000, and it went a little north of that as the project went a little longer than we had anticipated. Um, your electrical solutions, that's a, a vendor that we have on contract. Um, and they provided um, support. So we had to bring the power to the edge of the building and they had to bring the power to us. So, so that was a, a big part of that $60,000 was um, the fact that the units were three phase, 300 amp units and you know, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge of the electricians. <laughs> um, PAR did some site plans for us and then the rest of them um, become you know, much obviously much smaller but they're, they're important nonetheless with our fire alarm tie-in soil testing, things like that. Um, right now we have an available budget of just over $60,000. Um, I know the superintendent and the director of facilities have been looking at um, additional security and, um, and at our presentation at the Killam School a couple weeks ago, awnings is something that's on our radar, so we're looking at, at quotes for, for some awnings that to go over the ramps to provide a little more um, uh, relief from the weather, if you will. Uh, I don't know if you have any specific questions. Yeah, they all have gutters. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, gutters. All of that's all now all been yeah. installed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to get our permanent occupancy certificates without the gutters. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The additional security you're, you're referring to is that the cameras? Yeah, uh, that's it's it's more than that. <laughs> yeah. I I just want to say that I uh, appreciate. Um, where we're ending up here, and because it was um, sort of a bumpy road, mm -hmm. more, much more bumpy than we would have liked for this project, and it took a lot of time and a lot of detail, and uh, we had a great OPM, and you know, to Martha and John and Joe Huggins, um, I think did a great job that we are where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Joe was a, a tremendous asset to the yeah. project. Yeah. That's it for me on reports. <laughs> Hector? Yeah. Hector. I just wanted to echo and follow up on what Carolyn was referring to. Our last Tuesday, as you know, was our in-service day where all staff was in attendance, but the kids did not have school. Um, so there were all sorts of things going on across the district, um, professional development opportunities and collaboration for all of our staff, not just teachers and specialists, counselors, nurses, Paraeducators, group services, secretaries. Mm -hmm. Secretaries, yeah, I know. I, I, I'm I, I, so yeah. I'm <laughs> just going to start listing them off. I'm going to miss some. Um, so, in addition to some of the things that Carolyn mentioned, we had things like um, our literacy benchmark assessment training, where we had somebody come in from the program to provide training to our elementary teachers on that, the data gathered, and how to use that data um, from the assessments for the small group reading instruction. Um, uh, PD on our writer's workshop, the, the program, uh, the approach that we're using in the elementary grades. Um, in addition to having people from outside, we also had people from in-house presenting to others. Our coaches were presenting things also. Um, also in writer's workshop and literacy instruction, um, math instruction, our math coach and accountable talk strategies. Jason Cross, our METCO director, was presenting also on making connections and cultural competence. He had given some presentations in the past at our blue ribbon things that I think were really well received. We wanted to give him an opportunity to do that as well. Um, serve safe, I know our food services. Yeah. I think Martha was providing some training to secretaries as well. Mm -hmm. um, so just a very, I know it can sometimes seem counterintuitive of how the kids 
benefit when they're not here. But there's no question that they do when we use days in this way. Um, we're in the process now of, um, together with the district PD committee, getting feedback, collecting um, input and feedback based on the day so we can continue to make these days better and better as we move forward. I just also wanted to say, and listen to all the things that Carolyn has put together and sort of commend her publicly here as well, that through our MTSS efforts and stuff, over the last year, so I'm really seeing an, an overlap and connection between the general education and, and special mm -hmm. education, that just that sort of working together and where staff are seeing that connection, mm -hmm. regardless if I'm a special educator or a general educator, um, it has positive impacts on our kids. Mm -hmm. and I, I, really seeing that change. Yes. I just have a quick one. Um, Craig, can you talk about how you get that feedback on the PD? Is there a formal survey everyone takes? Is yeah. it more informal? What's the, what's the mechanism? Both, but well, we have sent out a, a formal survey so that everyone who was invo involved can give um, feedback on the overall day and structure and so forth, but also on their specific sessions. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I saw on the agenda that was not just sort of this uh, talking about the special education, but also um, just the just being able to customize the learning. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me that the greater leverage you can get in the area that you're talking mm -hmm. about with the general ed and the special ed, the greater opportunity the classroom teacher also has to address maybe the, the needs of other students that might, might need sort of accelerated mm -hmm. learning. So I think when we I think when we talk about special education, um, you know, we're talking about sort of the realm that Carolyn lives in, but I, I think the thing you have to keep in mind is that that collaboration and leverage then also allows the teacher to, um, you know, be able to address the needs across the entire spectrum of the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so even though there's not a para assigned or, you know, supporting a student that needs a greater level of challenge, this should help, you know, benefit those students as well so that mm -hmm. we can assure that, you know, all the students are, are challenged at the mm -hmm. level that they need to be challenged at. Do we have minutes to approve? Yes, yeah. Mr. Chair, move to approve the open session minutes dated September 29th, 2015. Second. Second. All those in favor? Nine, do you vote to adjourn? Move to adjourn. I'll send you that. Oh, Thank you. 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 Thank you